to this. You are tuned into the Combat Jack Show, the CombatJackShow.com. What's up, Premium? What's going on, Combat? Man, listen, before we start this episode, I really want to give a shout out to these cats, man, that have been showing us unwavering support for the past four years, man. It's this it's this uh web forum called the the Kali. Mm. The C O L I, the Kali.com. And week after week after week, these guys post our episodes religiously. And then they discuss I mean they, they talk about other things too. They talk about sports. It's a, it's really a sports forum. But of course, you know, I think it is, you know, people that are into black culture, black music, urban culture. So they talk about everything, but they've been really religious about posting our episodes and then talking and a whole nine. So like a, a couple of weeks ago, man, well, a couple of months ago, I joined the forum and I started commenting. So whenever we do an episode and they, you know, I give them the backstory nice. on like, you know, why something went this way or why something went that way. And I, and I really enjoy it, man. I really see it as, you know, unofficial compliment to the Combat Jack show. And so, that, so the, to, to the cast that run that, that, that forum, to the cast that comment on that forum and make that forum very lively, I salute you guys. The internet, y'all need to check out Kali.com, man. Man, listen, besides Kali.com, appreciative of all the sites that have supported us over the years, man. But you're right, forums are, I think, one of the groundbreakers of really, you know, connecting people together. I was never into forums, man. I always thought that shit was weird and geeky, and I don't fuck with forums, but the, the fact that these cats fuck with me, I fuck with them, you know what I'm saying? Hey, listen, thanks to the sites and, 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 and the forums and stuff that have made the Combat Jack show um, digital fans. Man, it's crazy. Just ask Ben Baller what's going on. Yeah, Ben Baller was, was on one last week, right? Internet. Our next guest, I don't even know where to start, man. He's done so many things. He's been involved in so many things. He's affected so many people's lives and perspectives and, and, and outlooks. He's an author. He's a documentary film producer, media personality, mm. internet radio host, relationship expert, mm. social commentator, focuses on the psychology of dating, as well as African American social history. Internet, I welcome to the Combat Jack Show, Tariq Nasheed. Cheer. What's good, family? What's going on, sir? Man, I'm out here in NYC, making the do what it do out here with you players. Yeah, man, what, uh, what you doing in New York, man? Man, I had some other interviews to do. I did some stuff with a couple of magazines, um, Huffington Post, just promoting the film. Yo, white media loves you, B. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's that's amazing. Yeah, you've been on the Jay Leno show and Leno. CNN I, I, and I was Fox. on C, yeah, I was on CNN last week. They're trying to bring me back. Um, Conan, I've been on Conan a whole bunch of times. Um, the, another network is trying to give me a show now. We're trying to work out all the particulars. Really? Yeah, yeah. So, They're trying to give you a based on uh, on based on my relationships. Okay. Yeah, they ain't, the, the hidden color stuff. They ain't gonna touch they, that. They're not, they're not messing with that, right? <laughs> they ain't touching that. But they want to keep me in the relationship zone. So I, I got I got what they call a high Q rating on television. This thing called the Q rating. Yes, the Q rating. Right, right. When they put you on TV, that's people just react to it. People just kind of take to your your personality. They they gravitate. They towards gravitate it. towards that. It'd be it good or bad because right. sometimes motherfuckers might be looking at me like I hate this nigga, but I'm gonna watch him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> who knows why they look at me? But the Q rating is high, and that's all that matters. Now I've watched your interviews, man, and I see you speak. Have you had media training? Uh, no, no, not at all, man. I just uh, speak from the hip, man. I just chop it up. You just game in the media, right? <laughs> that, right? <laughs> I just speak from the hip and just keep it 100. That's all I do, man. Now, Tariq, do you still go by the name King Flex as well? My my people, you know, people who know me know me. They call me King Flex. Like, when I do TV stuff, sometimes the, the white producers will say, well, what, did you want us to call you King Flex? I'm like, no, I'm like, it's called <laughs> Tariq. I don't know. It's going to sound real weird coming from you. you did. But um, King Flex, people still refer to me as that. Where does that come from, man? That's my old L.A. name. People used to call me King Flex back in the day. And the flex was because I was a real skinny dude. Okay. So I was, like, skinny, flexible. And I said, if I'm going to be a skinny, flexible nigga, put a king on the beginning mm. of it. Then. You wasn't putting no, no, no holes and no chokeholds, right? No, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't Chris Brown and nobody. <laughs> now, now, where are you from, dude? I, I was born in Detroit. And I lived in Alabama at, for a long time. But I'm w really Where in Alabama? Birmingham, Alabama. Mm. How old were you when you out in Birmingham? I went to Birmingham at like five. Okay. And I stayed there until I got into my teens, and I bounced from there and went to L.A. So I've been out in L.A. ever since. How was it in Alabama, man? I it mean, was Bur boring as shit. Right. I did everything I could to get up out of Alabama. Did not like Alabama. That's why people hear me, and they say, you don't sound like you from Alabama, because people from Alabama, they, there's a distinct accent. 
But I just never meshed with that because I didn't like the systematic white supremacy down there, even at a young age. You, was, you recognize it at I a young age? I recognized it as a, as a very young age. That's why I'm so cognizant about racism now. What did you recognize? When I went down there, one thing I noticed, and again, I was born in Detroit, and I lived in Detroit until five. Remember, right. the early 70s, you still got that black power thing. It's coming. the tail end of the, the, the civil rights end. movement. Exactly. So that energy is still there. Remember, there was all types of big riots in Detroit. So that rah-rah energy was still there. So my uncles and my people and my, my neighbors, and they still had that, and they were instilling that in us as a kid. So when I went to Alabama in the 70s, remember, this is when they had the force integration. So this was the first busing time that busing, whole, right. all that stuff. So this is the first time black and white people are going to school together. So I learned at a young age, and those white kids at a young age, they will practice white supremacy like it's nothing. They let you know that they thought that you were inferior. Now, a lot of black people who are from the South, they just kind of held their head down and took it and believed everything the white kids would say about them, even the teachers at that time, because in schools during the 70s, they started the special ed program as a way to segregate the black and white kids. And they started funneling a lot of black kids into special education. So everybody was in on this white supremacist BS down. And and not just in the South, all over the country, but in the South in particular. So segregating them within the integrated school. Exactly, because they could no longer segregate the people based on race. So they just redefined why they were going to segregate them. On so-called ability or whatever. Exactly. So now the blacks are just not smart enough. Right. So even the white kids would be on this whole thing where you blacks are stupid, you blacks are dumb. And I would challenge them all the time and I would get in trouble a lot. So I saw that the white kids would be protected by the white teachers and the white parents when they got raw on that rah rah shit. But then I would get in trouble when I would defend get myself. Put on detention I would get put on detention the whole day. I, I would get expelled from schools down there because I, I really wasn't playing with those kids. Where's that? Where's that sense of defiance coming from? Is, is it coming from your parents? Um, I wouldn't even say from from my parents because my parents, again, our parents coming out of the 60s, a lot of our parents were on that let's just go along to get along thing. Let's just be good Christians. Let's just let it slide. But there's something in me just that wasn't there. I knew what they were saying was wrong. I wasn't inferior. One way I knew because my family at the time, we lived nice. We weren't poor. But the kids who were saying that you niggas are this and you niggas are that, they were the ones living in damn trailer parks. I'm right. like, why are you talking greasy about me? Isn't it crazy how how, how uh, white supremacy works? Man? Yeah, yeah. So I picked up on that at a young age. I'm like, nigga, you, you got no teeth. <laughs> <laughs> and you're talking about somebody inferior? Come on. So I knew that wasn't real. So that that energy has always been in me. Right. Now, now tell us about your parents. Were, were your parents together? They were together at first, okay. and they, they split up, and my dad stayed in Detroit. My mother was in Alabama. Cool. My, my, my mother's cool. You know, she worked at the phone company for years. So I was a, a, an only kid, so I was a latchkey kid. So I spent a lot of time by myself reading. What were you reading, man? Encyclopedias. I remember my mother. The World Book? Those old school encyclopedias. Was world it the book, World Book the world or the book Britannica? Encycl- it was the World Book Encyclopedia. Yeah, the World Book Encyclopedia. That's when they were selling door to door. was crazy. Yeah. But the Britannicas were bullshit because it was just words. But the World, world book, book had pictures. Pictures and, and the, the skeleton with the little film so that you could peel the different levels. Yeah, and what's funny, reading those, because remember those old uh, Britannica encyclopedias were from the 60s. Right. And they would sell them in the 70s and 80s still. So you would have door-to-door salesmen selling these old encyclopedias. That's crazy. For cheat rate. And my mother got some and I would read them and they literally had like the word Negro in it. Yep. And the definition of a Negro, I swear to God, they had a picture of Harry, Harry Belafonte. Smooth, under the, smooth under the, Negro. Yeah, under the word Negro, there was a picture of him singing. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, wow, that don't look right. Uh, so you knew at a young age that it didn't look right. I, I knew at a young age that didn't look right. Also, they had a, I looked in the S section, they had slavery, and they had a bunch of black people, a, a painting of black people in a cotton field smiling. Smiling. I'm like, what the fuck are they smiling at? So I'm like, what are they, what are they trying to tell me? Now, was this pre or post Roots? This was right around Roots, okay. because remember, when Roots came out, we really got on that ah! right tip. <laughs> when Roots came out, Yo, we were on one. Pete, were you old enough to watch Roots when it came out? Um, very little, very little, but I do remember it. What like do you were you did you pay attention to it because you grew up in a different household you grew up in a white household an Italian household an Italian household did, I mean, did, was there any interest in watching it it was like ah eh, it's the moon and y'all hey no no I mean the, I, I wouldn't say it was like a top you know 
thing to watch. I mean, uh, growing up, uh, you know, we watched a bunch of different things in the house. It was more like, you know, but that really wasn't a top thing to watch. But I do remember it. Yeah, I, I'm going to yeah. tell you, man, every black kid, I don't know how I found, we were all glued to that TV yes, set. Yes, indeed. Man, we were on that rah-rah shit after Roots, yeah. man. So that made us stick our chest out a little bit further. So, so you, so you, you, you go to school in, in in Alabama, and then you end up going to where? Uh, to L.A. To L.A. Because I just couldn't buy with Alabama no more. Right. So I got that one way ticket, went on out to L.A. at like seventeen. Dropped out of school, the whole shebang. Oh, your own, got on you. my own, on my own. I told I'm your like, mom you was going I to told L.A. Told my mom, I, I'm going to L.A. She's like, No, you need to stay here, get some money. I'm like, No, I can't. I, I got to bounce. Ain't nothing here, so I got to bounce to L.A. I want to be a rap music producer. This was rap. Was what kind of there. rap were you listening to, man? Man, like um, Master P. This was before that. Okay. I'm talking about this is like the late 80s. So okay. this is like when it's like the, the golden era. Right. So I'm like, let me, I want to go be a rap music producer. Let me go out to L.A. and just fill it out, see what's going on. So I moved to L.A. I said, I want to go to Hollywood Boulevard where everything is popping. All the stars are going to be. I went to Thought Holly- it was going to be like the, the land Dude, was flowing with milk and man, honey. Man, I thought I was going to see the cast of Different Strokes, the Facts of Life. <laughs> man, the cast of What's Happening. I just I thought I was going to see all of that. Man, I got to Hollywood Boulevard. It was crackhead, gangsters, pimps, hoes, everything. The, Damn, un- did the, did the underbelly of society. Did that break your heart or what, man? It it did, but it didn't because then I got to know all these people, and these are the people that took me under their wing. Where were you staying, man? Man, when I got to L.A., I stayed at the YMCA for a few days. Okay. There's a YMCA in Hollywood. But I left there because this is what happens, man. When a lot of kids go out to Hollywood, they end up getting turned out. Mm. And they go to certain places, and they're rest havens for kids to get turned out. So I went to the YMCA. I got some vouchers from this little government agency to stay at the YMCA for a few weeks. And I'm at the YMCA, and they have these little rooms. There's no TV, just, just a bed and a chair. And there's a hallway where you go to the bathroom and take showers and there's another shower downstairs and i noticed every time i would go to the restroom there was some dudes be like hey man you going to the shower I'm like, what? What? <laughs> um you need some help i'm like i might you know, I'm, you know. <laughs> i might wash myself so, yeah and then i would go to the bathroom again another dude hey man see you down in the shower i'm like what the fuck are they keep why is everybody talking about the shower then it dawned on me that it's like gay dudes kind of hooking up at the YMCA. And that's I learned that the YMCA is a place where gay dudes would hook up with each other. That's why that's... Remember that song by y- the Village People? M- that's C- what that song by the Village People was. It was about dudes hooking up, cruising with the and having sex with each other at the YMCA. So you was at the main YMCA. I was at the main one in Hollywood. and Ground Zero. Ground Zero. And <laughs> what would happen, they go and get like young teenage dudes and turn them out. So I'm like, let me get the fuck up out of here. So let me go roll with some of these gangsters I've been hanging out with out here in Hollywood Boulevard. And that's who I started rolling with because the gang thing was real high and heavy in the late 80s in L.A. Gangsters like in terms of like the Bloods and the Crips? Those types of dudes. Okay. That was real, real heavy out there at which, the time. Which set were you hanging out? I, 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 was, I, I was cool with a lot of them. I was cool with a lot. Um, a lot of my buddies were, were sea riders. I rolled with them a lot. So people even today associate me with that. But I'm just, again, I was affiliated with right. some of those cats, but I was still good with blood dudes too. Right. I got a lot of good buddies. You were neutral. Blood. Neutral. I tried to be as neutral as possible, but I did get associated with the Crips a lot because when I would run into dudes, because you can't really be too neutral because I roll with these cats and they say, hey, man, we about to go hit up this store. We about to go knock this store off. And I'm like, okay, well, y'all niggas be safe. <laughs> I'm like, no. no. Deuces. We. <laughs> like, nigga, you, you going to drive. You gonna, be safe, nigga. You going to whistle or something. You're doing. You going to participate in this shit. So it's that type of thing. So you can be as neutral as you can to a certain degree. And also, when you see rivals, they don't know that you're neutral. Right. You know, because they busting I, at everybody. They, they busting on everybody. Now, I learned that very early because I would hang out with my buddies from one set and then I would go out and kick it like everything was cool and then somebody would say hey there's that crip nigga and I'm like break but, yourself but I'm not bam 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 it's right. like that okay so I'm like let me let me not try to explain shit let me just be about that life if I'm gonna be about that life right. so you know what I'm saying so um I, again I was associated with a lot of those cats and again they kind of took me under their wing looked out for me gave me the game now, um, now, what is the game, man? Like, what, what kind of game were they giving you, man? Just really, man, about hustling, the street life, hustling, and just life. There's a, a direct correlation between that life and the mainstream life. It's really the same thing. You want power. You all want power, and you go about it different ways. Now, understand this. When I was in Hollywood, I'm, I'm hanging out with these street dudes at night, 
And in the daytime, everybody kind of disappears. You know, you know, they just kind of slither away. You don't know where people go. And again, I'm not trying like to light of the living dead. Yeah, 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 basically. And I'm not trying to look like no weak dude, like I'm dependent on anybody. You know, I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm not telling everybody. I'm literally homeless. I'm still homeless at the time. So what I would do in Hollywood, there was a library um, on Ivar Street. I think it's Ivar Street. And I would literally live in the library in the daytime. They had a restroom there, and it was cool. You get out of the sun, and you can kind of rest up. So I would literally live in the library and hang out there until nighttime so I could meet up with everybody and hang with them because I could hang with these dudes, roll around, and eat. And they had money because everybody was hustling. So, you know, they'd break me off some, just, you know, hey, man, go run this errand for me, that type of thing. So I could get a couple of dollars hanging with the players. But in the daytime, again, I was still homeless. Right. And while I was at the library, I would just read books out of boredom. I would read all of these books about any and everything. And that's where I got this whole thing about history and all that. That's where it really got deep from reading all these books. Like what kind of books, man? Dude, I would literally read shit about history, books about etymology. I would read books about psychology. And then what I would do is use those psychology books and mesh those books with the knowledge I was getting from a lot of these street dudes. So all of it started making sense. That's why today I can relate to the street dudes and relate to the academic crowd. Right. And that's a very fine line it's to toe. It's a very fine very line. Very fine line, line yeah, to toe. Yeah. So that's why people say, damn, dude, you can, you out here on the streets with these dudes and the next minute you're on CNN handling your business. So that's where that came from. But But specifically, like in terms of like hustling, like did you learn how to hustle drugs? Where you hustle, like what just you- just in general, right? Just in general, because again, I hung out with not just the gangbangers, but I did hang out with the D boys and the PIs and right. all the the dudes out there. So I learned from a lot of these cats, and they kind of took a liking to me because and, they, and the PIs are the, the pimps, the pimps, the pimps okay. out there in Holly, and that right. was real big out there at the time too. And again, I learned a lot of game from now, those. Now, cats. now, what did you prefer hanging out with, man? The D boys or the pimps? Or after a while, because again, the pimps didn't like the D boys or the gangbangers. Why not? They didn't like them because they thought that because at the time in L.A. late eighties, a lot of the D boys and the gangsters would start coming up to Hollywood and Westwood because they were making money. They weren't just confined in South Central, so they would start hanging around in Hollywood. But the thing is, when they saw each other, they still be on that rah rah shit. Can't take niggas nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I was always like the mediator. I'm like, hey man, let's just let's just chill and get some of these females. Right. I would be all that type of you dude. Listen, let's, let's, let's get the females, yeah, dude. Yeah. Like, forget that, dude. I would talk dudes nah, out of a lot that, of stuff. Fuck that. Look at that morgue ass nigga. Yeah, yeah. It was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, it was a lot of that stuff. And as a matter of fact, what made LA real hot is that in I think around '87, '88, there was an Asian girl in Westwood who got caught in the crossfire. Damn, I think I dude. remember that. Yeah, I was I was out there when it happened. Really? Yeah. Yeah, so some cats out there from rival sets, they started busting on each other, and there was a girl from Westwood, Asian girl, got hit, and that made the block hot, man. Right. They started using them batter rams on brothers. They started shaking the whole block down after that, man. But, again, that's what the P.I.s were saying. Hey, man, Fleck, you need to kind of venture away from these dudes because they fucking up our money. You know, they're making the block hot. And, they, and, and, and then the P.I.s saw something in you? Yeah, because, again, I would kind of hang out with, with cats, and they saw I was a pretty stand-up dude. And, you know, I knew people who knew people, so I just came real cool with everybody. And, you know, they, they kind of took me under their wing. It was smooth. You knew how to move. Yeah, they, they saw that I was a real thorough dude. Now, and, now, as a young dude yeah. in that environment, Mm-hmm. I could imagine that you seeing like some crazy shit, particularly with the women. Mm-hmm. Now, now you seeing the women. You coming from a you coming from a small town, and now you're in this city. You're yeah. like in the heart of like Vice America, mm-hmm. and you seeing all these women. Like, what's are you trying to rap to them? Are you trying to get yeah. with them? Are you? timid like no you know i wasn't because I, I had little girlfriends down in alabama but i learned a whole different part of the game on the west coast and i learned from the dudes the dudes out there were, were I, I gotta interrupt you okay go ahead did you have a jerry curl i oh did i <laughs> no i had the jerry curl my you had dude, the jerry curl, the jerry curl. my okay. shit was luxurious luxurious dude no dripping soul glow was it dripping didn't... a little bit it, it, it dripped every day okay. i had it was drippy long i had all types of styles put highlights in it but i had the curl dude 
I was the curl you activator. You spent money on your hair. Man, I spent, I, I graduated <laughs> to the, the pink rollers. <laughs> okay, so, and did you yeah. have a, did you have a suit on, man? Uh, sometimes I would wear the suit. Sometimes I would wear the, the little Al B. Shore acid wash jeans and all that old sucker nigga shit. But right. that was hot back then, you know. Then I would wear the Adidas suit or the khaki. So whatever I felt that day, I switched it up. Okay. Yeah. But I learned out there, man, on the West Coast, the dudes at that time were ruthless with the women, dude. I saw dudes... I, I'd never seen dudes curse women out before. Right. That and was a big thing. That was a big thing. Because, because the thing that, that, that Southern guys are, they're yeah. gentlemen. We're gentlemen. And we like, still had that back then. Yeah. Because, you no, know, it's, to this day, it's yeah. funny. Whenever we go down to A3C, Pete, mm-hmm. and, and I bring my wife to Atlanta, she's like, every guy, every guy out here is a gentleman. I don't, I don't necessarily trust these motherfuckers, <laughs> but they will run. As a matter of fact, one of your boys made me mad. Because I was about to open up the door, car door for my wife, and the motherfucker beat me to the car door. And she's looking at me like, nigga, you let this nigga you, you beat me. You better step the, your game like, up. But yeah. that's how, so anyway, you come from an environment of, yeah, of gentlemen. So, so every, I'm on that gentleman tip. Right. You, know, you know, open up the door, put a coat over the puddle, that type of thing. How you doing, man? Yeah. So <laughs> when girls, and I ain't never seen girls this fine before, West Coast, I'm seeing all these bad Mexicans girls. Mexicans and oh, Asians. Yeah. And but even the black ones dark were like, skins yeah, and light skins. Killing and, the game. Yeah. So I'm like, Filipinos. we got to treat them special. Right. That's my mindset. These are extra fine. I got to really treat them special. <laughs> and my, my partners would have the women over kicking it and all that. And I'm cupcaking, trying to treat them special. Now, what is cupcaking? Cupcaking sir? is treating women extra special, right. um, 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 being too chivalrous. Holding hands, holding kicking hands, cans, early, yes. that, that type of bullshit. Blushing? Are you Bl- blushing at the women at the time? <laughs> <laughs> Sharing You're a blushing. slice of pizza and blushing? And, oh. Are you doing that? I man? wasn't blushing. <laughs> Put an almond arm and eating a slice of pizza. Yeah, but yeah. <laughs> Sharing the shake. And like, uh. <laughs> so anyway, y'all was, y'all, you was cupcaking. Yeah, we're cupcaking a little bit. And these dudes. I man, love that term. Yeah. Man. And these dudes would curse the women. I'm like, bitch, get the fuck out of my house. I'm like, no. I'm like, I'm getting offended. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, don't talk to her like that. Yeah, yeah. Nigga, fuck these bitches. And they would curse these women out, kick them out the house. And I'm like, damn, you just messed it up. And then they have another batch of finer women the next day. So I'm like, oh, okay. So that's how the game is out here. Now, did anybody pull you to the side and be like, listen, player. I just be cupcaking. They, they would always tell me that. Like, look, nigga, they would call me the square at the time. Man, come on, cause the square is tripping, man. Come on, man. You you tripping on these old raggedy ass. But bitches. there was still something about you that they liked. They like it. They right. kind of got a kick out of that, the squareness. But again, they I'm learning the game and they kind of getting a kick out of it, teaching me the the ropes out here. Now I'm, I I didn't want to go that extreme because I've seen them niggas like throw women in trunks and drop them off in the woods and shit. They were doing Damn. All, I would have to talk them out of crazy shit. Like, like son, that. don't do this. I'm man. like, dude, come yeah. on, dude. Yeah, you know, you're gonna make everybody hot. I hear you go. Cupcake again. Yeah, yeah this nigga got the cupcake with these bitches. I, I can throw a motherfucker in the, I can throw a bitch in the woods if I want to. I'm like, no, dude, let's, 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 let's just let her go. Let her go. Right. And I'll be whispering to the girl, run, bitch, run. <laughs> run for your life. No, right. You know, so again, I saw the extreme part of the game. So I wanted to do something that was more of a balance. Right. Not cupcaking too much, but I didn't want niggas throwing motherfuckers out of cars. So I wanted to focus on um, a balance in the game, and that's where my books and stuff came in. Okay, later, but later on down the line. But before that, did you right. dabble in, in, in the PI game? No, not at all. Okay. Not at all. No, I just hung around a lot of those cats. I didn't dabble in none of that stuff. I always been like a game advisor. I was always a liaison. I knew cats. A and, liaison between whom? Just, just dudes in the game. Just different dudes in the game. Like if, would, if dudes wasn't getting along? Yeah, that was my thing. If cats weren't getting along, and again, I was cool with a lot of bloods, PIs, cri- just a whole bunch of people. So when... When cats weren't getting along, I kind of talked talk to dudes. I was the voice of reason. How did you go from being this square to being this respected voice of reason so that you could talk to the D-boys mm. and the B-I's and the different... Like, how did you get to that point? Because they saw with me when shit went down, I always had their back. That was number one. At that time, too... We would get arrested a lot because the cops didn't give a damn what I said I wasn't affiliated sweeps. with. They like, do sweeps. Yeah, you do game sweeps right. every other week, all the time. So they would lock me into the gang cells and the whole thing all the time. Get me in those interrogation rooms trying to get me to cut deals, tell on niggas, all that. And the LAPD, I heard, was notorious. Dude, they they on another level. Was they hitting scandal. you with phone books or what? Man, man. man. <laughs> they they. I kept my mouth shut, so I didn't even let them get to that point. But they, I, I got threatened. My cops telling me, I'm going to fuck you with a pencil if you don't give me a name. <laughs> and a, pencil? Uh, my cop told me he was going to fuck me with a pencil. Number, if I didn't number give two, him a just name. make sure that shit ain't sharp. I'm like, B. what the hell does that mean? Right? <laughs> <laughs> but, dude, before this was before Rodney King. Before Rodney King, niggas would get fucked the hell up. Up out there, dude. Right. Rodney King was lightweight. 
that was normal, man. They were tearing brothers' asses up out there in L.A., um, making them confess and making them give up information. So Cat saw that I didn't give nobody up. You rode, I, you rode with the I, team. I, I rode with the team. I wasn't dropping names, none of that shit. Soldier. They saw that they've always respected that. So, so you get to this point now yeah. where you feel like you have enough game. Yeah. Like, what is the first aha moment, like Ober would say? What's that first experience that you have where you're like, yo, I got game? When they started listening to me and getting advice from me, because, again, like I said, I would be in the library reading all these books and I understood the game with them. So whenever my gangs, gangster partners would have relationship issues, which they do, you know, sometimes this, these niggas act like they ain't hurting but privately, these niggas be looking like they want to cry over some female that- Fuck like, tears, right? Yeah, uh, one of the chicks who done fucked the homie. You know, niggas act rah-rah, but that's fucking with them. She fucked the homie. Yeah. <laughs> like, man, fuck these bitches. So <laughs> I, I would talk to dudes and give them some advice from stuff that I read in these books. I'm like, well, look, man, the situation you're going through, man, the chick might be having passive-aggressive energy. I'm like, what the fuck this square nigga talking about? And I said, dude, the chick might just be trying to get you mad by fucking with the homie. Oh, okay, okay. It worked. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but she fucked the homie, though. Yeah. So I'm like, look, man, you're going to have to charge that to the game. There's a lot of more females out here. Man, females are feeling you. You got too emotionally wrapped up. It ain't about you. It's about her. This ain't, don't take it personal. So I started making sense to dudes. Right. And they're like, okay, yeah, that, I feel better, cuz. Now, you know, now, 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 you know I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an East Coast dude. Yeah. I've heard the term for a while, so pardon me if I come off sounding like a square. No, man. But, no. but what exactly is charge it to the game? Oh, man, that's one of my favorite terms, charge to the game, man. That means when you in the game, when you hustling, you can't cry over spilled milk mm -hmm. because you're already doing some shit that's edgy. Right. It's already gambling. The, risk, the risks are the risk, uh, yeah. part of the game. That's part of the game. Right. This is gambling. You're out here hustling. It's a gamble. And you can make educated gambles. You can make calculated gambles. But you might lose every now and then. Yeah. Even if you go to Vegas, man, you can play blackjack and you can count cards. You can be a, count, a card counter. But sooner or later, you're not going to hit 21 every time. So so if you lose money, if you lose so a you chick. So you lose a chick. If you lose, it's charge it to the yeah, game. Yeah, like, because okay. cats would get pissed off if they got busted. Their whole stash got wiped out. Niggas like, oh, fuck, man. I'm, dude, Nigga, charge, charge that, that to the game, to the game yeah. man. Now, That's what we do. Now, charge now, that shit to the game. You're giving advice, but what What are you doing with these women? Like, are you starting to, like, what's what's your involvement with these women now? My thing with, with the women is just dating, just, just kind of kicking it with them. Right. Nothing, you know. Now, were you dating wholesome women? Because you're living that life, man. Yeah. And the thing is, what's funny, a lot of wholesome women are intrigued by that. They're intrigued by that. No, they that, definitely are. They're very intrigued by that. So I would get the wholesome women, and, and my partners would like that because I would hook them up with wholesome women too. And it's because, crazy because every street dude wants to get with a wholesome yeah. chick. And wholesome chicks like those dangerous, exactly. edgy dudes. <laughs> now, and you got to understand, at this time in L.A., girls were afraid of gangster dudes. Not like this skinny jean do-rag shit now where they think it's cute. The rainbow street, Yeah, street niggas were scary right. to a lot of women. Yeah. It wasn't that cute shit. They were like, oh, that nigga's, he's with who? No, I can't roll with him. It was that type of thing. So the, the homies would be fucking with the hood rats. They can get them. Were you they ever were, into the hood rats? Nah, I laid up with a hood rat or two. But, but you don't, nah, like, I never, you don't I like bullet never, scars no, on the thighs? No, no, no. I don't like stab wounds on mm -hmm. their the ankles and all that old shit. So mm -hmm. that was never my cup of tea. Right. And and the, the players didn't like that either after right. a while because the hood rats, everybody ran through them. And plus, hood rats snitch. They, they snitch on everybody. Really? Yeah, hood rats. They ain't got nothing to lose. They ain't got nothing to lose. That's <laughs> a, Half the cats are in jail because of hood rats. Man. Hood rats, that's why they have diplomatic immunity. When you see all these world star videos of hood rats fighting, you notice they never go to jail jail they never go to jail hood rats got diplomatic immunity they use hood rats to lock wow. the hood down hood rats. folks don't catch that yo i'm learning game right yeah, now i'm son. telling you hood rats are like uh, crackheads yes. you know and yeah, you can't trust them you so, can't trust okay them. so 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 you 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 having relationships with these women and yeah are you noticing that you you know my game is strong yeah yeah because i'm i'm pulling better and better and better every time so i'm like okay what i'm what i'm saying is working and i'm getting a better caliber and, of women what are you saying man what I'm saying is, it's nothing in particular. What I do is be very honest and very confident in what I'm saying. And I always tell guys that it's not what you're saying, it's how you saying it. It's how you mm. say it. You know, because I've walked up to girls and said, hey, look, you got a booger in your nose. And they're like, what? What? What are you talking about? Well, you got a booger in your nose. Why would you say that? You got a goddamn booger in your nose. 
So you'd be very honest. Just be very honest. Be very direct. Just be not very disrespectful. Direct. Not disrespectful. Right. Exactly. Like and you wouldn't you wouldn't come up to a chick and be like, "Yo, I want to hit this." Right. That's that's corny. That's, yeah, that's just corny. a nigga. That's a nigga. Just that's, yeah. that's real angry energy when a dude says yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I would just go up to women and sometimes just say something off the wall, not corny. But I would just have so much confidence behind it. Mm. They felt that. Did you have jokes? Sometimes, if if it if the situation called for that, if the situation called for that, but women respect a dude who's honest about whatever he's saying, and women it's all about what you say, respect how you say it, confident. They respect confidence. Now it's, that's the it, number one thing. The first thing I learned at a young age, because I think I was very confident with women. Yes. Um, the first thing I learned was this, this cat. Because, well, tell me this: Why are men intimidated around pretty women, beautiful women? Not even pretty women. <laughs> Beautiful women. Because they think that beautiful women are out of their league. Mm. That's the thing. And a lot of Where dudes does that come from? That that comes from years of dudes, dudes who grew up around hood rats. A lot of them think that. Or women who belittled them. Because a lot of times guys are in high school and sometimes and girls, girls are mean in girls high school. Girls are mean as shit in yeah. high school. So and what they do, girls project a lot of their anger and insecurities on the dudes. And it's the pretty girls that are really mean. That are always in high insecure. School. Yeah. 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 And a lot of guys think, okay, if this Hood rat is dissing me. I know the dime is not going to give me no cooperation. Ah, I get but it. the dime is the most cooperative right. because most guys are scared to talk to her. Right. And she needs to feel reassured. Whereas the average looking chick, she knows she's average. So she ain't tripping. She's going to have this false bravado. Right. But the dime, she's like, am I still desirable? They always have to have that reinforced. And you can play on that. So a lot of guys are intimidated by those dimes when they shouldn't be. But even though you're confident, you still have to use some type of technique to be confident. Am I right or wrong? No, confidence is all about your mindset. Right. It's all about your mindset. It's I, just like a boxer. Just like a boxer. You can have all the skill in the world, right. but if it ain't, you ain't got that spirit, if it ain't in your mind, it ain't going to happen. I'm going to tell you what somebody taught me at an early age. Yes. They said, when you see a beautiful woman, use the power of your mind and superimpose an ugly chick's face. On her face. <laughs> make an ugly woman beautiful in your, I mean, make a w- beautiful woman ugly in your mind. And I would start <laughs> doing that. I would it, I would forget that these are dime pieces and just talk to them like they're average chicks. And it worked. Absolutely. And also what you got to do, man, what <laughs> women like, they I like. I call a, it the ugly girl technique. <laughs> you, you ever heard that? I've, I've heard that. I've right. heard some of the pickup artists. You, you don't that. really agree with that. No, because no. my, my, I, I have a different technique. My thing is you have confidence and also you got to react accordingly. Right. That's very important because women respect a dude who can react very fast to what they have to say. And you got you got to say something that makes a lot of sense because women are trying to throw you a curveball. So you got to have a real slick witty. response to it. You got to be witty and right on tap because what happens with a lot of dudes, they don't have a lot of confidence and then the first objection they get, it throws them off their game. And women see the insecurity in that. Like, if you meet a woman and you say, hey, how you doing? Um, what's your name? Well, my name is Lisa. Well, my name is Dave. Um, you uh, you here with somebody? Um, yeah. Well, you here with somebody right now. Yeah, and, and niggas say some cliche bullshit. Well, uh, can I buy you a drink? Ah, you know, some bullshit. Yeah. And women are like, okay, I've heard so that So what shit. would you say? It, uh, give, let's get let's do a scenario. Let's, okay. let's 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 act it out. Let's pretend that you're a female at the okay. club, and let's pause. Some shit. Pa- is that a pause? Pause. Yes. Pause. Good pause. pause. Good pause. Good pause. Okay. So go ahead. All right. Hey. Hey. What's going on? Who? What's your name? My name is Lisa Y. Hey, Lisa. Lisa Y. Or no, Le- Lisa Y. Lisa Y. I'm, I'm asking because I see you standing here by yourself. You here with somebody? What does it matter? Um. No, I'm just asking. You're in a social spot. Are you here to socialize? Um, you know, I really don't know you that well. Why Why am I talking to you like this? Well, I'm just being courteous. I don't want anything from you. We're just conversating in a public spot. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm extra compensated, <laughs> but I get it. So, yeah, so yeah. you just keep flowing. Just, just keep with flowing it, with hesitation. it. And don't let it throw you off. Because right. a lot of dudes, the minute they get a, any kind of objection, and a lot of times it's not that severe, but it just throws a lot of dudes off. They're like... Oh fuck it! Can I get your number? You know, they don't know <laughs> they what to panicking. say. They, they start panicking. Just right. stay cool. You're know, like, well, I don't want. I'm not. I'm just being social. We're in a social spot. I'm just socializing with you. Don't the ritual. Me. Yeah, yeah. I'm you being courteous. You, I always call. I call it the courtesy approach. Right. Always use courtesy. 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 You know what else I found, man? I remember being in clubs, and 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 a dime would be in there, and everybody in the club would just would just just take a shot at her. Mm. And I would just ignore the shit out of her. Ignore the shit out of her. But I would position myself 
So I was in her proximity. Mm, yeah. mm. But I would ignore the shit out of her yeah. to the point where it was like, well, why are you not rushing me? And it was boom, game over. <laughs> like, you, you, have you used that, the, yeah. the ignore a chick approach? To a certain degree, but you got to let her know that you're interested. You right. got to make that eye contact. Yeah, you got to make the eye contact. Yeah, right. You, you got to make a little eye contact. And also, you got you to gotta instruct the women, too. Because when you step to women, a lot of guys start asking shit. You, I tell dudes, never ask a woman anything. When you walk up to a woman and say, hey, come over here. We're going to dance real quickly. You leave You'll them. be surprised how many women are down with that. Right. Hey, come over here. Let's go sit outside in the VIP and talk for a minute. Right. They'll roll with you if you have enough confidence behind your words. Now, now, when you say the term lead, and I'm playing devil's advocate. Right. When right. you say the term you got to lead a woman, I'm sure some of our female listeners are going to object to this and say you guys are being sexist and rah, 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 rah. No. What, no. What do you think about that? Those women who are not qualified to be led, who, who would say anything like that. Because women, <laughs> they have a, women have a desire for male leadership. Right. All that independence which I, which stuff. I, which I, which I, which which I could is, understand. Right. And, and, and leadership doesn't mean somebody telling you what to do. Right. That's something that a, a woman who's insecure would translate. Um, the whole I'm independent, I don't need a man, that's something that white feminists instilled in black women during the 1960s, early 70s. Right. And that was a con game. A lot of sisters don't like that I'm independent nonsense. You want somebody that you can really get some game from. You want right. somebody who can upgrade you. Right. That's a natural thing. But you for don't women. Want, women for want women. Some, you right. want a dude who can lace you with some game, give you some real deep instructions on how to progress as a couple. You want that because women will say, okay, I'm independent, I'm independent. But if you get a dude who's following you, women will never respect a dude like that. Right. Ever. Women don't respect dudes who follow them. I don't give a shit right. what women say. But what about if you meet a woman who has a very strong personality? Right. And she is a leader by nature, mm -hmm. and she wants to lead, and there's conflict in that. How do you, how do you resolve that? Well, the thing is, you got to be self-sufficient enough to deal with that. Because the thing is, on a subconscious level, a lot of women like this will look for dudes who they can date down with, meaning a dude who has less than them. Mm. So a dude like that, you can tell them what to do. But a woman like that, if she's dating a dude who's a boss, she can get back into her feminine role and respect that dude's leadership, no matter how strong it's she is. It's an option for uh, her. Right, right. It's, a, it's an option for her. A boss dude wants a woman who's strong like that, who can handle business when he's not around. He prefers that. But she has to be strong enough to defer to her man. And I don't mean in a submissive way right. as she's less than. She's his better half when he's not there. So mm -hmm. how does it? How do you start writing a book, dude? I start writing the book um, in '99 because I built my weight up. I would give relationship advice to my friends. Right? Are and, you working at the time? No, I've always, you know, I, I stopped doing the square thing a long time. You ago. never had a job. I, I, I did have a couple of square little telemarketing jobs okay. and all that stuff. Wearing like a corny suit? No, 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 no suit. I was too young for that okay. for the suit. But you know, then I, I got out of that, and, and I you just knew started. you didn't. That, that wasn't my cup of tea. And at the time, you would prefer to even go broke than work for somebody. Yeah, okay. yeah. I, 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 the last time I even applied for a square job, I remember that. And I'm saying, I ain't never doing this again. Right. So I, I started getting my little grind on, doing my thing and, and being self-sufficient. And I would give relationship advice to a lot of my friends. And what were you do when you say grind? What were you doing? Well, I don't I don't go too much into okay. the particulars. Really? Okay. Yeah, yeah, because the thing is. Um, you, you don't got, you, you, you got, don't ever snitch on yourself. Yeah, yeah, and not just me. People that I know, because right. right now they got shit where you say, "Well, I did this back in '95," and there's my there's a nigga who I don't know who knows somebody I know who's listening to the who's Combat listening, Jack who's, Show. Who's listening? Yo, listen, <laughs> listeners to the Combat Jack Show. Even if you might work on the other side of the law, please don't. Come on. Don't incriminate none of my guests. Yeah. Please don't do that. Anyway, I'm yeah, sorry. Because yeah, you got dudes out here whose cousin <laughs> might be locked down, and I say something, and they put two and two together, and then he goes to some prosecutor and cut a deal. Got it. So, so you were so grinding thing. and grinding. I'm grinding. I'm grinding. Got I'm a getting, little apartment. Right. I got, got an apartment. And uh, another story about that. I, I had an apartment at like 18, and I, I would have parties at my apartment. And, you know, the girls and everybody kicking and all that. And I had a neighbor that I really didn't know, but one of my friends invited the neighbor to the apartment. And again, I didn't even recognize the guy. And this same neighbor went to a club with us, too. We took pictures. And again, I'm not recognizing. Black was, person? It's white, a black dude. It's a black okay. dude. But black again, I'm not even noticing because we got a whole bunch of people yeah, yeah, rolling yeah. with us. So one day, about a month or so later, I get a Fed, a federal agent comes to my apartment. Hey, Mr. Nashi, want to talk to you about this dude. Gives me the guy's name and shows me a picture. I'm like, who the fuck is this? He's like, you don't, do you know this guy? No. 
you sure you don't know this guy? You know, he's a drug dealer. He's this. We've been watching him, and damn, he lives in your building. I'm like, I don't know the guy. And then they showed me pictures of me with the guy. I'm uh. like, oh, fuck. So you sure you don't know him? Like, we don't want to incriminate you. We don't want to incriminate you. Now, if you give us information, we'll make it worth your while. Damn. They were doing that type of deal. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, okay. No comment. I'll have my lawyer reach you. And that's right. the last time I heard from that. But at that point, I learned to watch who I hang around. Yes. And also, at that point, I never, ever spoke to a cop again. Mm. Ever. Because the thing is, when you answer any question, they might say some shit you don't recollect. I don't remember taking a picture with this dude in the club. He was just something in the club. But, if but they, they were, still use if the fact yeah, that if, I, if they went to court and had me on tape saying, I don't know this guy. Like show this I'm, yeah, I'm a liar yes, now. So yes. nothing I say is credible. So I learned that lesson very early on to keep your goddamn mouth shut with cops. Don't say nothing. Even if you're innocent, which I was because right. I didn't know the dude. But it don't even matter. It don't matter. We, because we, we never innocent. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so that's a lesson I learned. Right. Yeah. So so how do you end up writing this book, man? So, again, I'm giving relationship advice to just my friends. And we, and we would hang out at the club and I would and just dating and getting women. That was like a hobby. I made it a little hobby within myself. And sport. It was, it was a sport. For like, me. like, 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 I bet you I could pull this. Chair. That was my thing, because me and my friends, we would go out, go out. And our thing was getting girls to come home with you that night. That, that night. was our sport. Right. And we became very good at that. And then Which isn't really that hard, but you would be surprised. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, and to do it without spending money. That's yeah. the thing. That okay. was the key. So if a chick said, I just want a $10 burger, you, you, you wouldn't I even... didn't buy shit. You didn't buy shit? I didn't buy no drinks, now, nothing. How, how do you do that? D- dude, and that was the sport of it. You meet women, and what you would do, you would find women who would be more likely to roll out with you. And usually those were the more high-caliber women, surprisingly. A lot of dudes because they had more confidence. They had more confidence, and also they're not trying to come up on anything. Right. Meaning, uh, a hood chick or a skank. I want chick, a meal at least. I want. I want a meal. Can I? Can you get a bitch hair done? Can I get my nails yeah, done? Can right. you break me? It was that. You Buy know, my kids some J's. Right, right, <laughs> right. With the hood chicks, you know, they got like another agenda. Yeah. They're trying to come up, and it's a poor mentality. People that always want something for something. I realize even. Regardless what class you are, even if you're making money, that's a poor mentality. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. So I, I would tell dudes, always avoid that. Always avoid the attention whores, too, because there are women who just feed off attention. You got women who come to the club with cat suits and their titties all out, and they ain't going home with nobody. A lot they, of chicks walking around with, right now with their ass cheeks out. Yeah. And a lot of those women, they ain't going home with nobody. Right. They're just trying to get attention. Really? What no, about? Yeah. So, so don't go go for the ones with the ass meat out. All and, the ass meat out. They, they, they're going for attention. Okay. You want to go, if you go out and you want to get somebody to go home with you that night, you want to go for the most conservative-looking woman in there. Mm. That's the woman who's going to go home. And the less people she's with, the more likely she's going to go mm. home. The uh, prude? The, the, the one you think is a prude. You think that's, she's a That's prude. the one that sucked the skin off your dick. That nigga. That prude, she dropped, <laughs> the, she dropped that business suit, <laughs> had a, a clit ring, and the whole shebang. What is it about that? What, what is it about that look, about that that? That because, facade. Because women like that are trying to compensate for being secret freaks. Mm. Women like that, the real librarian type, the real prudish type, mm. those are the biggest freaks. That's why teachers are always getting caught fucking their students. Because teachers have to be prudes to a certain degree. And you got to subvert your sexuality. You got to be this upstanding demure. citizen. You got to be demure. You got to be respectful. And you got to be a pillar of the community. And Putting up that facade all the time, you gotta suppress mm. your your skank desire, and then it just comes skank out when they desire. least expect it. And that's so, why they end up fucking the students. So basically, in a sense, you're indirectly advising my listeners that they need to start hanging around the libraries, <laughs> the college campuses. Yep. Don't hang around the high schools. Botanical they gardens. They, they might pick no. you up for that that no. pedo shit, B. But even the girls at the regular clubs who right. who are more conservative than the other women. Okay. The ones who are by themselves, those are the ones who are going to give you the most cooperation. Because if a woman is by herself and confident enough to go to a club by herself, she she's sucking dick that yeah, night. Yeah, she's she's down. <laughs> she's that got nothing to prove. Whereas like girls who it's a lot of girls and they're hanging out as a bunch of friends. You're gonna have somebody cock block you. Right. Yeah. yeah. They, there's a designated cock mm, blocker mm. in that group. Do they actually consciously designate they, somebody? They or, designate. Or, Unconsciously. They make one the designated cock blocker because oh. they know women know that each other they were they're emotional. Women know that one of their friends is gonna have too many drinks. They're gonna see a motherfucker who looks like Chicks more is jealous. Chestnut. Yeah, and also yeah, women are jealous. They see a girl getting a dude about to go home and and get it in. Uh-uh, Angie, no let's girl, go. they're gonna get on that whole fake Claire Huxtable <laughs> shit. Girl, you better than that. Yo, girl, that type of shit. Right. Do you put so, this back to like when you just said about how 
you know, the prude or, or the girl that you think, you know, the business suit. You put it back to, like, remember growing up where it's like you would meet a girl and she'd be like, listen, if you don't tell your friends or you don't go around putting it, I will, I, I'll fuck exactly. you. Like, you know what I mean? Like, because like, there was a lot of girls I remember growing up, and that's how I learned my game was, like, if you shut your fucking mouth and you don't tell all your friends that you were smashing the shit out of it, you possibly be smashed, like, you know, the next door neighbor. Exactly. And that's the thing. Women don't want a dude who has that dry snitching energy, dudes who's going to tell their business. So a lot of women who are real conservative, they got that freak thing in them, but they just don't want everybody to know because they don't want that negative stigma. Whereas the girl with her ass cheeks out, she's like, well, I ain't fucking nobody, so I can wear my ass and my titties out. That's her mentality. And I say, if you're trying to get it in at the club, avoid her. Right, you, you dig? Avoid the one that le- looks like the, the lowest hanging fruit. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> okay, exactly. So so once again, man, so you, you're giving advice, man. You, you're, you're playing the game. You bring your mm-hmm. chicks in your, your apartment. You, you're yes, putting indeed. points on the board. How does this book come about, man? So, I'm getting students because now guys are like students. square dudes. Square are they dudes paying because you now, yeah, this is where we're going now. Square dudes, square motherfucker, you yeah. start <laughs> charging consultant services. Um, the dudes started offering, right? Hey, man, I heard you. You know, you were chopping up game at the club because we would get a little VIP spot at the club, and guys would sit around and we would just chop up game, and I would give dudes advice, and then cats start saying, "Hey, man, can you teach me some of that stuff one on one?" I said, okay, well, you know, I'm busy. I, I give you this much and that much. Like I'm how like, much? Um, my fee what? was a thousand dollars a weekend. A f- mm. your fee? Yeah, but was a thousand dollars a weekend. weekend. Meaning, what the the clock started on Friday? The clock or started Saturday? on Friday. We got the cats dressed on Friday. Found out, you know, what their their swag is like. Find out what their problem is. What are, what are cats dressing in? Now this is remember the late '90s, so you got Eddie Bauer suits and shit. Right. You know, you know stuff like that. What cats. about cats that don't like to put on suits? You don't need suits. You know, just as long as you're clean. Right. But again, I would have dudes in suits at the time because I would wear a lot of suits. So I would tell dudes, man, you want to look like a million dollars so you can right. get treated like a million dollars. Right. So you want to be the most reputable looking dude you can be. Now, what kind of guys are this? Are these guys with jobs? Yeah, square dudes. Okay. Just guys, you know, square dudes trying to get into relationships, right. trying to just break the ice with women. And I would just teach them how to do that. And I would get them dressed first, find out what their confidence level was. Go out with them Saturday to kind of test the the waters, but Sunday would be the big night. I would let them you gotta do close. Their, yeah, you got to close the deal on right. Sunday, right? And I would get them straight. I would get the guys get their game together for the most part. Now, did you have a return policy? Like if if, if, if it didn't work, <laughs> they didn't get no pussy. They, they get a money, refund, money back guarantee. If you didn't get no pussy, no. I mean, you know, as long as they got the confidence they needed, right? That was the most important thing, and they respected the game. And and then the word got out that I was giving this advice, and people started hearing about it. This is unreal, B. Yeah, pimp one on one. This yeah. is really unreal. So, so you you're building a business now. I'm building a business now. So I said, okay, let me do did this. You have let a me. business card. I did have a business card. What, you know, did the, what the fuck did the business card say? King Flex and my phone number. That's okay. it. My phone, my card said King Flex and my phone number. And I would give it to women as a conversation piece. I would tell dudes. That was another thing I would tell my students. Get a card. Don't put all that bullshit on it. Um, carpenter, dog groomer, cat, dog uh, groom. whisper, all Doctor. that bullshit. Put your name and your number on your card and give it to a woman. That's a conversation. Because piece. that's also a bold That's a bold thing. move. Right. They're like, what do you do? Call me, we'll talk about it. And women mm. are like, wow. You know, women would get intrigued by that mm, yeah. because the thing is most dudes are trying to sell themselves to women. When they and, meet and women, I'm a producer, I'm a photographer, a do you model? Man. I'm a certain, yeah. And I'm like, no, I, I just do a little this and that, but I want to talk about you. And right. women would be very intrigued by that. And I would teach guys how to have that kind of energy and not try to sell themselves. Get her to sell herself to you emotionally. Did you ever have any bad experiences? Like, fuck that nigga, I want my money back. Not not for my players, no. Okay. no not at all, no. They they respect Is that what game. you call your students? Your, your, my players. Right. I call them my players. That was it? They a gradu- were my, 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 my intern players. Was yeah. it a graduation process? No, no. Did you give them like a, like a I scroll? I didn't give them a Mac diploma. Cat- <laughs> <laughs> it was like ID, ICDC for so, Max. You brought them Gators. You brought them Gators after they were okay, done. Okay, so, so you're, you're, busy, you're, you're King Flex businesses yeah. pop. And how yeah. many clients would you get a week, man, or students? I'm sorry. I would get about... Three students a month. Right. Three students a month on a regular. And that's what made me want to do the book. I'm like, let me get a manual for my students. Step by let me step get a step-by-step step book so I can have this for them so they can read through it and get the game so when I'm with them, they can really, really get laced up. Did you look for a publisher? I did, you know what I did? I didn't know anything about book pub- book publishing at the time. So I got a book called The Literary Marketplace. It has the names of every publisher in the planet on there. And- I basically did any, mini miny, mo. 
I found a place in Chicago called um, Frontline Books. I think that was the name of it. And I saw African-American. That's all I was looking for. I'm like, okay, I'm looking for somebody who put out African-American books. I called them. They were the first people I called. I told them who I was. I said, hey, I got this book, The Art of Mackin. And they were some Jamaican dudes. Yeah, I'm on Mackin. Yeah, yeah, The Art of Mackin. What is that? (laughs) You know, that type of shit. So they're like, send the manual. So I sent it to them. They're like, we want it. We'll give you $400 for an advance. And again, I don't know publishing. Right. I'm like, can you give me 800 I'm like, yeah, we'll give you $800. I, they gave me $800 for the book. That shit sold 250,000 copies. Where? On All Am- over. Uh, this was before Amazon, dude. Before Amazon. This was before Amazon. So like, like wherever b- they black sold books out here, sold. Out here in New York. Or like on Mom, and, Mom and Pop. Like the, the cats that had the car. This, this is the 90s, 2000s. Black bookstores. Book, black book mm. renaissance. Yeah. You, you remember, we had bookstores yes. then. Black bookstores were everywhere. Yes. The swap meets everywhere. So that's how it sold. In prisons, too. They sold the book in prisons. Also, what happened. Did you by, buy a copy, Pete? I didn't see that book uh, when yeah. I was there. Okay. Yeah. And. White college kids started buying the book. They probably thought it was being ironic. Right. And then they started they, learning the but game. But they learned the game from right. it. White college kids would buy it, too. So the book just took off, man, incredibly. Were you surprised? I was really surprised that it took off. It, it took off heavy. And then all the major book companies started calling me. Like, nigga, how the fuck did you do that? Because you were smart enough or lucky enough to retain your rights to the book? Or I didn't. That's the thing. I got the rights later. I didn't have the rights at the time. I, I went through a whole legal dispute with that publishing you had to company. Sue, you had to sue the dreads? I had to sue the dreads. I had <laughs> to sue them because what happened was all of these movie studios started hearing about the book, and they started calling me, offering all types of millions of dollars deals for the rights of the book. But for the, a movie? For, for the book, for a movie. Right. And the Jamaican dudes were fucking the deals up. Nah, were, mama, nah, no, 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 Okay, uh, Tariq, you're going to have to give us 70% of the publishing and 70%. So I have, I would have to have give, given them all the money. I'm right. like, oh, man, I, God damn it. So I got to get the rights Now, back. here you are, somebody that, that, that came up on the game. Yeah. And now you find yourself in the situation. Are you kicking yourself in the, in the, in the, in the Yeah, I'm kind of pissed off. Because, right. But again, I'm, I charge, charge it to, it the, to game. the game. I'm charging mm-hmm. it to the game, yeah, though. Yeah. I didn't get too bent out of shape. I'm like, okay, they came up. Okay, I didn't know that game then, but I know it now. So they made a mint. They, they made a grip off of it. Right. I didn't. A, a lot of that money I didn't get from the Art of Mac, and I did not get that money. How did you retain the rights I got back? The, they said, okay, if you drop the lawsuit, we'll get your rights back. This okay. was later on. What was five the, I'm, later. I'm a lawyer. Yeah. What's the, what was the lawsuit based on? It was based on... Them not giving me my royalties. Not accounting to you. Right, not accounting. They weren't accounting for it correctly. Um, And also, they were messing up deals. They were trying to, because they had the rights to the book, temporarily, the rights were temporary, but they kept messing up deals. They kept trying to get too much of my other deals that were going on. So they settled, right? You didn't. Right. Have, they didn't give you a dime. They they didn't give me. Well, they they gave me some royalties a little bit, but they kept most of it. And the deal was okay. You drop your lawsuit, you can have the rights back. So, but here, but but, but at the same time, the book ends up on the New York Times bestseller. Yes, it did. I mean, the New York Times gave it a great review. The right. whole shebang. And, and when you, how were you feeling when you're reading the review, knowing uh, that you don't really fully own? All the rights to that book. But the good thing, and I, I charge that to the game because yeah. now all the other publishers are calling. Simon & Schuster called up. And they're like, look, big boys, we'll give you a deal. We'll right. give you a deal. So they right. broke me off like $100,000 Wow. to do a, another Art of Mac and book. But I said, I don't want to do that. I want to do a book for women now. So my second book was called Player Be Played. It was a book for women. And that ended up being a big seller. Was then, it also a New York Times bestseller? It wasn't on the New York Times, but it was a bestseller. Okay. Now, my next book was a New York Times bestseller, which was The Mac Within. The Mac Within. And I was smart enough this time, I only signed one book deal. I didn't do that whole 10 book deal thing. Right. From that point on, I'm like, one book per publisher. Hit That's it and it. quit it. Hit it or quit it. Right. That's it. And while I had Play Be Played Out, I had a deal with Penguin Books. Penguin, yes. For The Mac Within. They gave me another $100,000. So I'm like, I'm getting all, I'm macking these motherfuckers. They're going to give me all my money. So I'm getting money out of them. And now MTV is calling. Okay. So I'm doing stuff on MTV. I did an episode of Made. I'm doing like the Jenny Jones show. Right. So the book is just like huge. And you're big in Hollywood now. You're, you're yeah. doing these talk shows. I'm doing these talk shows Jay Leno. with Jay Leno. Yeah. Are, are you fucking pinching yourself? Yeah, I'm like, hey, this is cool in the game. This is cool in the game. Out of all of this that's going on, yeah. share with us your most intimidating moment. Mm. My most intimidating moment was a guy from the Rolling from Rolling Stone magazine. He came out to interview me. They wanted to do a story about me. And with them, 
they wanted to kind of follow me around and get uh, a feeling of my life. And what this dude was doing when I interacted with people, he would kind of go behind me and try to get information from them about me. And then the streets started talking a little bit. Like, this is the old nerdy white dude. They were like, I'm getting phone calls like, hey, man, Flex got this dude. You know, what, 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 make, what's up? What's you know? going on? So now I'm looking. I'm like, I had to, you know, I didn't want to fuck up my street shit. But it's still Rolling Stone <clears throat> magazine. It's still Rolling Stone right. magazine. But again, this dude is kind of making the block hot. Right. You know, he got people talking and he's like. Hey, uh, <clears throat> so who is this guy and what's your affiliation with him? Right, right. So that don't look Burr. good. Yeah, that don't look good. So I'm getting a lot of phone calls and I had to kind of tone that down. Right. But other than that, everything was smooth sailing. Man, this is fucking amazing. Yeah. Listen. Yeah, I just want to tell you something. As we're sitting here. And he's going on his journey. I don't even know what, what, if he's 21 or 22 at this time. Uh, he has dropped game on each of those years. And, and I'm sure right now you're smashing rainbow chick, like just every, green chicks, <laughs> orange, Captain Kirk status, right? Are you Captain Kirk status right now? No, I've done, done, done that. I didn't be, cause we, men go through stages, man. Men go through um, three stages. You go through three stages of game. You go through the first degree player stage which is the when you're a teenager you're trying to figure out how to get ladies you're trying to get wet you're trying to get wet that's your whole thing you're trying to figure it out you're 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 hit and miss you're cupcaking you're simping you're tricking (laughs) you're doing everything to try to get your foot in the door that's the first degree stage now the second degree stage is when you you got your little niche going on you figured out something that worked on a regular so now it's all about getting notches under your belt you want to get as many women as you can using that one particular technique. If you're the kind of dude, you put on a certain cologne and you go to a certain spot that gets you some ass, you go into that same spot every week. You're a creature of habit. Right. You, if you set up Alizé at your house in a blunt and you get pussy that way, you're going to keep doing that. After a while, you're going to get to your third stage where you say, okay, now it's about quantity instead of quality. Mm. One thorough top-notch woman is better than 15 of these yes, ratchets. Yes, yes. So you're going to get I mean, to that quality stage. over quantity. Oh, yeah. yeah. Quality over quantity. So yeah. now you're going to start wanting that real down chick because it takes a lot of time and energy to be on that player shit. Yeah. To date a lot of women and juggle that shit women. It's exhausting. It's very exhausting, and the man. And you get is the shit's not worth it. It's a job, dude. Yeah. Yeah. Even my PIs, my, 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 my dudes, they would say, man, this shit uh, is a full-time job juggling all these women. You're dealing with all these personalities, so you can't do anything else but deal with them. Right. So um, I tell dudes, it's, it's really, you, you go for the quality. And that's why I'm. I got one lady right now. Yeah. I'm, I'm chill, so I done done all that. Now, other now, stuff. now, bef- before we go to our break, man, are, are you ever really gonna just settle down and have kids and have a family, man? Yeah, I already do now. Okay, I, I do now okay. for the most part. So, yeah. so you're off the market. I'm off the market. Yeah, okay. I'm good. Yeah, excellent, I got, excellent. Yeah, <laughs> listen, man, listen. You, you tune into the Combat Jack Show, the Combat Jack Show dot com. Let's go to a station break. We got. Tariq Nasheed yes, right sir. here dropping game. Game on top of game. Yo, listen, internet, you know what it is, man. Mm-hmm. F your radio show, F your podcast, and F your TV show. Be right back. Internet, connect with the Combat Jack Show on all our social media platforms. Instagram, Twitter, iTunes, the website, combatjackshow.com. Check for us. Search for us. Find past episodes. We have hundreds of episodes with your favorite artists. CombatJackShow.com. Check it. Hey, yo, Internets, you are tuned into the Combat Jack Show, the CombatJackShow.com. Cheap. Listen, Internets, are y'all picking up game? I'm saying, are y'all, are, y'all, are y'all learning something, man? I know a lot of you motherfuckers out there is 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 is, is laptop thugs <laughs> and, and laptop lovers. You know what I'm saying? Get off that porn, man. I mean, you, I know your right wrist is strong right now, nigga. There's nothing wrong with porn. But, but, but get off that right now. Learn this real game. This, you know what? There's nothing wrong with porn, but there's a whole lot much better with the real thing. Yeah, but porn taught me, like, certain positions and how to fuck. Like, I would watch yeah, but porn. But you're saying as a, as, as, a, as, as in terms of learning variety, but motherfuckers are stuck in this game with the, with the porn shit. Well, what do you, what do you think about porn, Tariq? And yeah. then I want to I want to switch up. Yeah, porn is cool. My, you just shouldn't be dependent on it. Yeah, you know, and that's the thing. A lot of dudes, and not just porn. A lot of dudes become dependent on the internet. Period. Yeah, I've had dudes hit me up like, "Hey, man, I'm having relationship issues with this girl." And I asked him, well, how long have you known her? Well, I haven't met her, but we just talked on Facebook. <laughs> oh, fuck, nigga, fuck. get the fuck out of here, dude. <laughs> <laughs> we DM each other. So you got dudes who have 
they think that the internet is real life. Niggas be thinking that they're dating the porn chick. You dig what I'm saying? So that kind of mentality has to stop. We got to get out here in the real world and do real things. It's always going to be the real world. Yes, Listen, indeed. Tariq, let's switch up gears, man. Yes. How the fuck do you go from being player player yeah. to hitting colors? Man, you know, with relationships, there's a direct correlation between relationships and racism. Okay. And when my book, The Art of Mackin, first came out, and again, like I said, a lot of white kids were buying the book. And then I would get white cats because the book became so big. White dudes would be like, well, Tariq, can I learn something from this book? I'm like, why wouldn't you learn something from the book? Well, can I get women? Well, shit, I can get white women with the shit that I wrote. So you can get any kind of woman. So they would always ask these racial questions. Also, I noticed when I would give different races of people advice, there were other hurdles they had to go through. Like I could give a group of white guys advice and say, hey, look, go to the club Saturday say this, say that to women, pull them out the club, have a good time. And if I say the same thing to brothers, hey, man, go to this club, go to that club, meet women, pull them out, have a good time, they would say, well, what if the club don't let brothers in? Mm. So there was always that extra hurdle with brothers. So I said, let me delve into the racial issue. Also, another thing with brothers, there's an extra layer of insecurity there because you're constantly told as a black person you're less than you're not good enough. you're not good enough so there's a level of thirst that's there that's extra with brothers too because when you see dudes parking lot pimping outside of clubs that's thirsty insecure shit you know what i mean when you yeah. go to a club and after the club is a bunch of niggas in t-shirts hey what's your name holla 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 that type of dude right so that type of thirsty energy comes from insecurity and a lot of that insecurity comes from being racially dissed a lot so I wanted to talk about race in a realistic manner. And when we look at race and relationships, relationships are ultimately about procreating. You want to meet somebody, get into a relationship with them, procreate, have offspring. And that's always been a taboo subject. And we don't talk about taboo race. Taboo subject with our community. Right. With, with, no, just in America. Okay. We're talking about racism and relationships. And relationships. Okay. Because when you have to understand, there were laws against certain people hooking up. Like yes. Black dudes couldn't marry white women until it was like illegal in many places until 1967. They had miscegenation laws. So that was a real big thing that we just never talked about in this country. So that's how I got into the whole relationship thing. And not, not relationship, but the whole racism race thing. thing. Right. Because the whole situation, for example, with um, Donald Sterling, yes, that was about relationships and racism. And race, yeah, he's having this relationship with this woman of color, which is in his world taboo. It's taboo already, and he's like, "I like you, you're good, but don't have those other blacks around." Right. That type of thing. So the racism is right there. So that's something that we have to talk about. So that's what I wanted to do with the Hidden Colors series. But did you set off wanting to talk about race and relationships because? It's still a quantum leap between race and relationships and hidden colors, B. Right. Now, in my books, some of my books, I do touch on race a little bit. Right. Like my book, Player Be Played, I talk about white women dating and black women dating and dating interracially. And I have a book called The Art of Gold Digging where I talk about interracial dating and the taboo-ness of that. So I just went on all out with the whole hidden colors thing when it came to racism because one day I was watching the History Channel. Right. And, you know, on television, you know, they hide all of our shit. Whenever you see, like, ancient Egyptians, they look like a bunch of Puerto Ricans. And, and you know what? <laughs> These white boys are getting bolder because now they're just looking white. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they got a movie now. They got a whole bunch of white I people. I just saw the trailer yeah. for this new movie with uh, Christian Bale playing Moses. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like and and homeboy Russell Crowe just played um Noah. Noah, yeah. And you know the excuse they had for that because people kind of called them out on that like, "Wait, people in that area of the world didn't look like British. You know, what what's that about?" And the director said, "Well, basically that Noah book is a book based on fantasy, so we just took creative uh, license uh, with get it." The fuck you out you of dig it. what I'm saying? There's a whole lot of creative no, license it, in it, Exactly. Everybody's white with British yeah. accents in the fucking Middle East. All so, right. So, got so it. you're watching the history. So I'm watching the History Channel and they did this show about who came to America before Columbus? So I'm knowing about this because, again, I've read books by Ida, Ida Van Sertima, yes. all of these. D- the ISIS, Rico- did you read the ISIS papers? Uh, the ISIS papers changed my life. Right. Yes, indeed. I read that book and that changed my life. So I read all of Pete, these you got to read the ISIS papers. Man. Heavy book. I will. Okay. Heavy book. So I'm looking at this whole thing about who came to America before Columbus. I'm like, oh, cool. They're going to tell the truth, finally. So they said, well, there's a possibility that Asians came to America before Columbus because mm. they found a string that looked like silk. I'm like, okay, keep going. 
They found a piece of metal that looked like it could have been a Norwegian coin. They said, where well, was Vikings that might have came over here? Then they said the Jewish people might have came over. Then they said the Irish. Everybody. Everybody. I'm like, are they not going to mention the old Mex statues? The, 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 credits, the credits came up. Yeah, I'm like waiting and waiting. And I'm like, they didn't mention the old Mex. All these, this huge mountain of evidence down in South America of all of these African artifacts. And they said nothing about it. Right. I said, okay, this is propaganda now. Yes. So you, so you realized it. it I realized that, that, that was, at that moment. I said, this is propaganda. That was there's, the tipping point. That was the tipping point. Right. I said, there's no way in hell they don't know about the African presence in America. And I know it. How the fuck do I know it? I'm a nigga who write Mackin books. And I know it. And they don't. Let me ask you something yes. before we move further. Do you really think they know it or do they not know it? Dude, I know they they have to know it. If they know about a coin found in the dirt in Peru somewhere, you can't tell me they don't know about these huge statues of African faces called Olmecs all around South America. Okay, once again, giving them benefit of the doubt, okay. right? <laughs> because all of us have been brainwashed and systemized hmm. to believe one thing. Do you think that even when they see the obvious, that it's very hard to believe? That's the question. Because one thing I don't want to believe is that these motherfuckers are being that insidious with regard to our past. Dude, the thing is, we live in a system of white supremacy. Yes. Where people are believing or are trying to believe or trying to get the myth out that if you were born in Europe and you're classified as white, somehow you are genetically superior to these African people. Yes. That's the foundation of this country. Anything that challenges that, you're going to have to lie about. So now, if you say that these Olmec statues that are very obvious. And this is in, where, in, in Peru. In, in, the Olmec statues are in Mexico. In Mexico. There's another thing in Mexico called the Bone Impact murals where there's actual paintings of these black-skinned people with dreadlocks. It's down in Mexico. So if you acknowledge that and say, hey, these people could possibly, just say possibly, they could possibly be African, now you're chipping away at white supremacy. Because, see, white supremacy says that African people did nothing. They were sitting around that, in West Africa. Our history started with slavery. It, we started with slavery. We were sitting around Africa. Mud huts. We, we, in mud huts with Scratching bones in nuts. our noses. We didn't have a wheel, no language, all that okay. bullshit. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So... If you accept that, you're chipping away at white supremacy. Right. And they don't want to chip away at white supremacy. Okay, so so let's scale it back again. So you yeah. see this, and you see this propaganda, see this on, propaganda. on the history channel. Right. Where does that lead you? That led me to talking to my people online, my, my people who listen to my podcast. I said, I'm thinking about putting together a film about history. What year is this? Well, this was in a 2010. Okay. It's 2010. And no, it, before film, I was going to do a book. I said, I'm thinking about doing a book about history. The name of the book, I'm going to call it Secret Niggas. Mm. That was the name of the book. It, it, it might was going not to be, have sold that It well. might not have sold. I thought right. about it. I'm like, as people said, that, that might be a cool idea. I said, wait, wait. If I do a book about history, that might bore people. I'm going to do a film yes. where it's just me talking about history, something that John Henry Clark did back in the 90s with Wesley Snipes. Right. Wesley Snipes produced a, a documentary called A Great and Mighty Walk. Great film if you haven't seen it. I haven't it. seen it. Yeah, with John Henry Clark, he's just sitting there talking about his life, talking about history. So I was going to do that. And then we started a Kickstarter page. And I said, So you were early on the Kickstarter? I was early on Kickstarter. This was before a lot of people knew about right. it. And I told all of Damn, my listeners. you were hustling, man. Yeah. <laughs> I said, I told my listeners on Ustream, I said, look, I want the men, if we can raise the men, if you can raise $20,000, I don't want nobody else but black men to donate to this thing. The first hidden colors. Y'all get twenty thousand dollars on Kickstarter. I'll put another twenty thousand in, and we'll do a documentary. So we put the thing up. Brothers got like twenty six thousand dollars. Then I put another twenty thousand on, and then we well, I actually put more than that. But we did the first hidden colors. And what I did instead of me just doing it, I got a bunch of people that I liked and respected. I got um, Francis Cress Welsing who wrote yeah. the ISIS papers. Yes. I got a whole bunch of other scholars that I liked. And again, I didn't know how the film was going to do. This is nobody's ever done anything like Hidden Colors before. Right. A history film talking about hidden history of African people. Nobody's never really done that. So we put that out. We get it in select theaters. And I'm in the theater in L.A. just like literally crossing my fingers like, man, I hope this shit don't bore people. Because it was like two hours of people talking. Of people talking. So and I'm like, man, I don't want to be embarrassed. I'm here. I don't want people to be like, this nigga put this boring ass movie together. So, so in a sense, that might have been your most intimidating moment. Yeah, yeah it was. Okay. It was. It was because I didn't know how people were going to receive And you're that. in an area that you're not comfortable with. It's not necessarily your area. Now you're right. being a scholar on 
the history it, of race exactly. and mankind, really. Right. And, you know, I, I talk about history in private. Yeah, that's like it's a hobby because, right. again, I read a lot of books and I studied it on my own, but I've never brought that to the public. So it shocked a lot of people that I would even know a lot of this stuff. Because this is just, you know, I'm into the Mackin books. You're like, who, that, that pimp nigga? Yeah, this is the Mackin <laughs> nigga. How you know about, you know, right. history, nigga? You got Mackin books. It was that whole type of pushback from right. certain people. But the film took off. Right. The film blew everybody away. And it, it sold through the roof when we put it out on DVD. And that's, that's the genesis of the Hidden Colors series. Now, putting Hidden Colors together. Yeah. Because the thing about race. Yeah. That's so maddening. Because I've been on this journey now for some years now. Yeah. Is the more you find out, mm -hmm. the more you continue to find out. Absolutely. And the more mind boggling it is. Like, 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 didn't it feel like you, like this shit was not real? Yeah, it was heavy. And what's interesting, a lot of stuff, man, is written in older books. I noticed that. If you want to get some real knowledge, get old books written like in the 1800s. Because at that time, a lot of them, they would tell the truth about a lot of stuff. Because they knew black folks couldn't read. Uh, uh, they made black people not read. So you're so talking they, about American books and, or, American, or European and, books? And, and, and American books. Now, European books also, that's another thing. A lot of our information in history is written in other languages. Like right. a lot of stuff about the Moors, it's written in like German. And you got to go overseas and get some of those books. Like when we do, did the research for Hidden Colors 2, I had to go to a lot of museums in Italy. And they got all our shit in there. All our statues and paintings and but all they know that. they know brothers are not going to Italy. They know brothers ain't going and over if they there. Go looking. to Italy, they trying to get the the the, the, the Gucci. They not trying <laughs> to read. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So let's let's start, man. Like, yeah, who were the Moors? Man, the Moors were black African men who went into Europe in the Middle Ages and they literally civilized Europe. What do you mean by civilized? Civilized because at the time Europe was going through a dark age after the fall of Rome. I think around the. 400, the year 400, Rome fell, and then all of Europe basically collapsed economically. So people were struggling, starving, cannibalism was rampant. They kept getting all these plagues. Damn near half the population of Europe died off. People were just like living in filth out there. It was just, it was a bad time. So in 711, African men went over to Europe from the, from North Africa. They went into Spain first, and they kicked off what we now know as the Renaissance era, but they brought in science, technology, um, medicine. They healed everybody. They created universities in Spain, and they really got Europe's weight up. And most historians know that that's attributed to the Moors. Now, what they do now is try to make the Moors not black. They'll say, well, the Moors were really Arab. Or dusky. Or something. It, th those are code words. Right. Arab is not a race. Right. You understand? Right. So watch those code words. They reword things now. They say, well, the Muslim conquest. Wh where were the Moors from, though, specifically? What country, the, if you could attribute a country in Africa to the Moors? The, uh, the first army of the Moors, when they went into Europe, they came in from the area we now know as Senegal. Senegal. To North Africa. Then into Europe. Okay. So the Moors, when the Europeans described them, there's a book called The Song of Roland that was written in the um, early Middle Ages, and they described exactly what the Moors looked like. They said, these these people are jet black, black as pitch, black as a raven, nothing white except their teeth. These are the Europeans' words right. as they described them. So there are paintings out there that we put in the Hidden Colors movies, one painting in particular called The Wild Men and the Moors. It was a painting that was done in the late 1300s showing jet black men in castles fighting off Europeans who are trying to invade them right. in Europe. So the Moors, it's not a question if they were black or not. They were definitely black. Moor actually means black. So these were African black men. And people will try to reword stuff now to try to throw you off the scent to make it seem like there was something else. So when the Moors <clears throat> entered Europe, yes. what was the relationship like? Was it a was it a, 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 a mutually beneficial relationship? What did the Moors have to gain right. by civilizing Europe? What they did, they took over that territory. They took over they the made territory. It an extension they they of, made an extension of North Africa, right. basically. And they did they do it, it violently? Did they invade? They didn't really have to do it too violently because they... Uh, a lot of people surrendered because that Moorish army came in and they were strong. They, they were they were very thorough. So it didn't have to be that violent. You right. know, some people, there was a pushback from the Spanish, but um, they took it with ease. And uh, instead of subjugating and dehumanizing the people, they said, OK, you convert to our religion. 
We'll give you books. We'll what, educate what was the you. Religion? Islam. Islam. Okay. Yeah, they were they were Islamic, and they went into Italy, did the same thing. In, in Sicily, they did the same thing. There's a great book called The Muslims in Medieval Italy that talks about that too. So there's a lot of good books on this stuff. But they came in, and they made that area an extension of Africa to a certain degree. And again, at the same time, you had West Africa, Mali, the Timbuktu Empire that was thriving. You had the brother, like I mentioned earlier, Mansa Musa, black king, right. who was the richest man on the planet. So Africa was thriving all over the world. And where does Carthage and Hannibal and all of this come? That's in? before. This yeah, that's before. That, that's before. This is before with regard to civilizing Greece. Where did that come? Right in? now, remember Rome because we're talking about the fall of Rome. Right. Yeah, before the fall of Rome, you know, Rome was popping, but Rome was again, um, it was influenced by Africa as well. Even Greece, even right. the the Greeks are a fixed mulatto race to a certain degree. Right. You, you know what I'm saying? Because uh, even the Greeks now that we, when they came over here, Greeks weren't even considered white until like 1920. Right. You know, a lot of folks forget that, but they were a fixed mulatto race, just like a lot of Italians too. They were a fixed mulatto race. So while the Moors are in Europe. Yes. Bringing Europe to a certain level. Yes. What happened? What happened was a lot of infighting. A lot of infighting. Infighting with the Moors. With the Moors. With the Moors. That was their problem. They got into a lot of infighting, fighting over power. And what happened is that they had the Inquisition because, again, the the Christians, it became a religious battle. A lot of people say, we want to stick to our Christianity. And while the Moors were fighting with each other, these little Christian pockets were getting their weight up, organizing with each other against them. And that's when they had the Spanish Inquisition and pushed all the Moors out of Europe. But where does Christianity come from? Well, Christianity... That's an extension of African religion as well. That We talked about that in Hidden Colors too. The um, Isis, Horus, Aset, all of that comes from ancient Egyptian um, uh, religion and mythology. So all that comes from us. And they have they made a, a different version of it, took it into Europe, and then gave it back to us. This is why I think African people, when we, came, when we were brought over here, we took to Christianity so easily because we— instinctively felt a connection to it not the white jesus thing but the principles of christianity right. because we've always lived like that um treat your brother a certain way look out for your next man don't covet your neighbor's wife that was a, an african mindset so that's why we took to that so much now i was watching hidden colors 2 last night yes and that you spend a lot of time talking about the p- p- pineal pineal gland pineal, yeah and and melanin yeah and how the me- the pineal gland and, and, and black people is different from the pineal gland and, and what we would call white people. Right. Yeah, we talked about that. Our brother Anthony Browder was breaking that down. Um, even in, in, in African history, in Egypt, the pine cone has always represented the pineal gland. Yeah, you showed a lot we of images of, yeah. like, in a lot of, like, uh, classic art. Exactly. The pine symbolizes power. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And the eye of Horus represents the pineal gland. And you look at certain... Eastern religions, they have that dot on their forehead, which is representative of the pineal gland. If you look at a dollar bill, that eye in the pyramid, the all-seeing eye, it, right. it, the all-seeing eye that represents the pineal gland. So there's so much symbolism with that pineal gland and the eye and the pyramid. So we just have to know how to connect it all together right. and, and see where people are getting this information from. They're getting it from us and then giving it back to us. Right. But the pineal gland is really responsible for the creation of melanin. Yes, it triggers off the creation of melanin. And because black people, we have a a functioning pineal gland. And most people of European descent, they have a calcified pineal gland. And this is this inhibits the production of melanin. Now, what's what 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 is the result of this difference? Um, Well, the skin pigmentation, that's the ultimate thing. But certain scientists say that the pineal gland is like a receptor. You can feel the rhythm of the earth more differently. You have a certain rhythm. You have a certain vibe with the universe when your pineal gland is functioning. And I know for a fact that certain people who do have calcified pineal glands, they're looking for things to activate that pineal gland. And they have meetings and melanin conferences on how to activate calcified pineal glands. Oh, yeah. 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 They've been having conferences for years. Like where are they having these conferences? I've heard they've had them in Europe, um, all over. There's like... um, um, schools and universities and and scientists over here studying that pineal gland that it's it's real heavy now now what is moorish science moorish science is basically when the moors went into europe they brought in alchemy 
They brought in um, principles of the elements. And Did they, they bring in me- metallurgy? And- they, all that stuff in, all that stuff in. And basically, people who knew that information, that was for certain people. You, they didn't just give that information out to certain everybody. Certain people had to be thorough enough to learn this kind of information because it was very powerful. Right. So the Europeans took that and they created secret societies with that. And this is where masonry comes from. All of that stuff is it has Egyptian origins because many people say that the Moors were the leftover Egyptians when there were invasions in Egypt. People spread out. Some people say they went to West Africa. Some of them became the Dogons. But a lot of them were the Moors that we know who went into Europe. And a lot of that information became masonry, what we know now. So this is why in, in Masonic sets you have the. Um, Morse this and they they use these terms and people don't know how to make that correlation. So so okay so so the Moors are infighting. Yes, the the the, the Christians are huddling up. Yes, and then what happens? What happens is they started to banish and and fight back and fight the Moors up out of Spain. They Why? Started, they wanted to make Christianity the dominant religion. Okay, so it was it was a it was a religious it was a religious thing. It wasn't a race thing. Because, not race thing. Right. Not race thing. Because again, many Spanish people, you know, they were still they were a fixed mulatto race, and people didn't really judge to judge each other too much based on race. Even though there was a saying in Europe called "black as a moor." Meaning that a person, they call it black a more. That, that's right. where that term comes from, black a more. And more is a descriptive descriptive term. The Moors didn't call themselves more. That's another thing. The Moors were described as Moors by the people who saw them. And because English was not the dominant language, they didn't say black and Spanish wasn't the dominant language. They didn't say Spanish. They used the word, which was Latin, which was more for a black person. So right. they were called more based on their look. And again, they had a lot of infighting with each other and they got infiltrated by the Christians there. And they were trying to make Christian the dom- Christianity the dominant religion. And eventually they banished the Moors out of Spain. And this is why Spain... When they banished the Moors out in 1492, that was the last year they brought the Moors, kicked the Moors out of Spain. That's when the Spanish started to discover the world. That's why Spain had a foothold on technology to, quote unquote, discover the world for Europe because of that Moorish influence. How then does the, 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 the whitewashing come in? Because you say the Moors influenced Europe so greatly. Yes. How does the whitewashing begin? Well, what they did when they got rid of the Moors, first of all, they wanted to get rid of all of the remnants of them being there. They started throwing out because what they wanted to do, they wanted to cleanse it of all of that influence so it wouldn't come back. When you get rid of something, you're supposed to stomp it all the way out. You don't want to leave any traces of it, even though there's still traces of the architecture and all that. But they wanted to make it a Christian society, get rid of the heathenous Moors, the infidels. That was their whole thing to crush. They burned all types of books and manuscripts. They did all images. They burned as much stuff as they could out of Spain. And this is when the whitewashing started. The whitewashing really got started later when the slave trade happened, because again, racism didn't really come into fruition until around the 1600s. 1600s. Yeah. When, when the Dutch started yeah. enslaving African. Right. This is when, yeah, the, racism as we know it now, that's when that got started. It, it got started later to control the black and white people that were really over here because you had white indentured servants and you had black indentured servants. Right. They were called European and African indentured servants. They weren't called, people. white people weren't called white until like the 1500s. Right. And the Spanish started that by calling their indentured servants Blancos and they called them, they called the whites Blancos and the Africans Negroes. When they brought whites and blacks over here, they had them both working on plantations. Yes. When you look at some of the early oh, yeah, documentaries, that's, documented. In, that's in, very well. Indentured servants. As indentured to servants, yeah. yeah. Um, there were whites and blacks getting together saying, hey, man, let's this, run this, away. This, let's, this let's, shit ain't happening. This ain't happening. Right. Let's all get together and overthrow these guys, the landowners. And they were getting over on the landowners for a long time. They were these rebellions between um, these white and black groups against the wealthy. That was... They were working and the wealthy landowners had to come up with a strategy to dissipate this. They said, "Okay, this is what we're going to do. The Europeans, since we look kind of like you, we're going to cut a deal with you. After your indentured servitude, we'll give you something called freedom dues. Freedom dues meant you get land, you get a weapon and you get some money. But we're going to make those Africans slaves for life. 
As long as you don't do that rebellion shit. As long as right? you don't get with them. As long as you don't get with them. Because you're with us. You're with us. They, they kept dangling that carrot. Now, you ain't going to get as much as us, but we're going to give you certain privileges. So they got duped. They got duped. They got duped. And they fell for it hook, line, uh, and sinker. There was no more rebellions. The last rebellion between um, the, the whites and blacks getting together against the, the wealthy landowners, there was something called the Bacon's Rebellion, I think, in the mid-1600s. But that was it. After that, they started putting these racialized laws into to play. And it worked like a charm that kept people divided, that kept a buffer class going, that kept blacks and whites from not fighting with each other or fighting against the dominant society, the the landowners. And they took over people that way. And now, it worked like a charm. Now, did this spread back to Europe? It did. It did sp- uh, spread back. To Why? Europe. Because the, the, the Europe system, the European system is different. Why did it spread so Willingly, why? Why did it spread so so, so because, efficiently? Uh, because remember, man, the the people over here were European aristocrats. Right. Remember, they're the same people. So they went back and forth. They were European aristocrats who were landowners here. So that mentality, they said, "Hey, look, over in Virginia, over in Jamestown, we got some shit that works like a charm called racism. We need to try that shit over here." So they brought it over there too, and it worked. So there. racism was basically a new thing. It was a it new was, thing. It was like, "Yo, you got to try this racism exactly," shit. because that system is the most thorough system ever It was a created. new philosophy. It was a new philosophy. And a lot of people, and a brother named Neely Fuller, who's a great philosopher, he, he talked about this. He said when they introduced that, the reason why it probably worked so well, because people probably didn't take that shit seriously. Uh, if you say, hey, look, I'm going to divide you people based on the color of your skin, people were like, oh, that's silly. Yeah. That ain't going to never work. i go along with it now, but this is some silly bullshit. Right. And it ended up dominating the world. Because it's silly when you think about it, but what happened, it worked so well, then they had to make it scientific. So early 1700s, there was a guy named Carl von Linnaeus who came up with the color system. He said, well, all people are white, black, yellow, red, and brown. That was the first time somebody came up with that. Because if you look at it, you're uh, an Asian person. An Asian person ain't yellow. Yeah. Indians ain't really red. Yeah, and we're not black. We ain't black. Right. Exactly. Some, Some of us are. Yeah. But, you know. but, but, but again, it was just a, a color system made up by one dude. Right. Later on down the line, there was another guy named Blumenbach who came up with the word Caucasian because the word Caucasian is new. A lot of folks don't know that. And nobody called themselves a Caucasian back in antiquity. The Caucasian, the word Caucasian was created in 1795 by one dude, Blumenbach. He said, well, look. There's Negro, Mongoloid, and Caucasian, and the Caucasians are the best. Mm. And his shit was easily debunked, but now the cat was out of the bag. So now that's when white supremacy was born. People saying Because they had to fuel the the slave trade. They had to fuel the... It became economy. Because, again, you had people within the the peasant white society who wasn't down with that. They're like, hey, y'all mistreating people. This ain't cool. I mean, I don't want to go along with this. But they said, hey, wait, look, we got this book saying that they're inferior. You're Caucasian. You're better than them genetically. So they deserve it. So they were like, okay, if you say so, I guess that works. So they had to justify that. They had to justify it um, biblically, too. They would get Bible passages and say, hey, look, look at the curse of Ham. The Bible even says it. See? So they ran a whole con game on everybody with this whole racism thing. On top of the philosophy yeah, and on top of the economy, it seems like right now, man, there is, when you look at our society, yeah. when you look at this brother that just got murdered yeah. the other day, Eric Garner, when yeah. you look at, when you, where is this hatred coming from? This hatred of people of color? Because now it seems like there is an obvious hatred of people of color it's not just a racism thing where some people are superior allegedly to others but there's this hatred this this innate sense in it i would believe that there's a and you said this also in hidden colors too Mm -hmm. there's a war going on right now against people of color Mm -hmm. where is that coming from dude white supremacy is a religion it's a religion it's a religion we gotta look at it as a religion it's a religion and that religion the god which is white skin it gives you certain things. It delivers. It ain't like these other gods. You pray and pray, you don't it get nothing. It gives it to you immediately. It, it gives you stuff. So right. this God works right. for those who are able to worship this God. So and they, access it also. Because they, I think one of the things, you know, over the past couple of years that, that, that Pete probably has gone through is like, to Pete, he's like, what the fuck is white privilege? I'm white. What is white privilege? Mm. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, you know, until Torre brought it up to me. Yeah. A couple of years ago, you know, I really didn't understand what he meant, but it found out, yes, I do have white privilege, but I was never really accessing it. Right. 
you know, or maybe I wasn't aware that because I because it's natural. Because a, a lot of times you, it's. I was over in Thailand for as an example, and I was over there visiting, and I was in a store, and normally when I'm in stores, instinctively I walk slow. I just walk slow because I'm like I know a motherfucker watching. I don't, you know, and I'm walking slow in Thailand at this store. Then I looked around. I'm like, ain't nobody paying attention to me. I'm in Thailand, so they ain't even <laughs> tripping on me. I'm like, oh, I ain't never felt that before. Right. So the thing is, this freedom, this freedom, right? It's a freedom there, and those here in the dominant society, there's a freedom that you get that you don't even notice that you get because it's just so normal. You can drive to a store, you can drive down the street and not worry about anything. If a cop looks at you, you ain't tripping. You don't. Know, it's a cop. Hey, you wave at the cop. We know we wave at a cop, we're going to get pulled over. I'm not waving at a I'm cop. I'm not waving at no damn cop. We can't do certain things Pete, that you, those you the cops. No, nah, I mean, not me, but, but I understand yeah, what you're you saying. Yeah, you understand that. Right. And that doesn't make all white people bad or nothing like that, but there's just a privilege that's afforded to the dominant society that a lot of them are not aware of. Now, there's some who are very well aware of it, and they act like they don't know. Like when you go to court and you have people who get on that jury. They know jury nullification. People jury know selection jury selection. Science. It's a science. They know if they get a bunch of white people on a jury, they're going to vote racially. They know this. This is a science. So there are people who are very well aware of white privilege and, and jury nullification and but, all but of these things. But even with regard to like jury nullification yes. and how juries respond, yes. why is it that a group, a, a predominantly white jury, yeah. will rule 90, 99% of the time against it. Why is that? Is it them buying into Dude. the religion of It's a religion. It's or a is rel- it their bias or the brain? Like, what the fuck it's is it? It's a religion, it? dude, through osmosis. They know we have to maintain white power. Why? We, what we, is, what, what's, what's the alternative? Let me break that down. Yeah. And Dr. Francis Chris Welsing talked about that in her book. White people are the genetic minority on the planet. White people are less than 10% of the planet. Yes. We look at movies and it just seems like white people all over the place. Jesus, white people, Moses. Right, yeah, exactly. God is white, Santa Claus is white. Right, right, right. White people are less than 10% of the population. So white people are a global minority. And white people will understand this, even on a subconscious level. So in order to maintain your numbers, you have to think in terms of group think to a certain degree. You know deep down you got to think like the next guy. So you, there's an osmosis there. You know what to say and what to do to maintain that level of white supremacy. For example, the O.J. Simpson situation. Yes. Now, O.J., they've been trying to get that dude for years after that case. Oh, man, it was it was a wrap. They what, what were, he, dude, they were trying to get O.J. for years. They That's another thing about white supremacy. When they get a, a glitch in the system, they're going to fix that glitch. OJ was a glitch in the system because yes. what happened, they abused so many people in Los Angeles and we saw that abuse and what happened, they went overboard and ended up getting a black jury and we said, okay, well, shit, there's reasonable doubt. The This Mark Furman, he's a racist, so we can't vote guilty. they like, oh, hell no, a black dude accused of killing two white people, got off. A white woman? A white woman? That's never happened in the history of America. So they... Said, okay, we got to fix it. We got to fix this glitch. They tried to get OJ on cable. They tried to get OJ on everything. He took somebody's sunglasses off. They tried to sue him for that. So they literally set him up. This whole shit they got him on, they set him up. The dude who called him up said, hey, man, I know somebody who stole your stuff. Let's go get it. He had a wire. Everybody and their mama had a wire. So all of these people worked in concert to set the dude up. Now, so we'll never see. Another brother beat the legal system like, like O.J. Also, again. after O.J., if you notice, they stopped letting race become a factor in many cases. Like this new that. case right now. This, yeah. This, 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 um, Renisha McBride case. It, the first today, th- I read today and I had to tweet it. It said in the New York Times that the pr- prosecutors started this case and avoided the whole race factor. Exactly. Even with Trayvon Martin, they avoided the whole race thing. Yeah. In all of these cases, you notice the first thing they do, well, race was not a factor in this whole situation. But 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 these are the prosecutors. Don't they want to prosecute the person that killed the black person? Because what they're going to do, if they, the defenders, the, the lawyers, get a bunch of white people on that jury and they're trying to use race, they know off the bat that these people are going to vote for their race. Right. So if we're going to make it racial, it's going to be team white, right. whoever we get on that jury. So they know that. So, I think so it's a catch-22. It's a catch-22. Because they can't win. It's a The Paula Dean situation. You remember this? Paula Dean was getting sued by a white employee. Mm-hmm. The white employee heard Paula Dean say nigga. Right. And the, the white lady ended up losing the case because why? 
she's not black. That's that's why she lost. You she, can't sue on behalf of black you people. Can't, you can't sue on behalf of black right. people. But the thing you is, you weren't black, damaged. You weren't damaged, exactly. But black people can't sue because Paula Dean is not going to say nigger around them. Right. So that catch-22 is there. They fixed that glitch. They fixed that glitch heavy. Is, is President Barack Obama a glitch? No. He's very deliberate. He's not a glitch whatsoever. Not a glitch at all. President Barack Obama was very deliberate. He was tokenized. Because you have to understand... When we had all these white presidents like George Bush, people were trying to blow this fucking country up yes. with George Bush. Yeah. The, the he image, fucked up so he bad. He fucked up bad. People strapping bombs to their assholes coming over here. Pause? Is that a pause? pause? Is that a pause? Pause? Okay. No, 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 no. I'm going to have to decline that pause. <laughs> okay, all right. Yeah, yeah. All right. Sorry about but that. But yeah, people had bombs and shoes. That's why we're at the airport now. We got to take off shoes and yeah. throw our water away because of George Bush's ass. Right. So- the world had a very negative image of, of Americans, especially white Americans, of white America being this racist place, not just to African-Americans, but to every other race. So America had to clean up his image. So they had to get this black man out of nowhere and say, hey, look, we're not racist. We have a black president. And that's the role of Barack Obama. When I travel the world, that's the only thing people like two things about America. They like Barack Obama and hip hop. Yep. That's it. You go around the world, people see me and start pop locking and shit. And Dude, Obama, I, I was in Belgium, yeah. in 07 when when Bush was still in office, yeah. And I was hanging out with these Belgians, and this one dude in particular, we w- we would get drunk, and he would be like, "I don't understand why you people haven't ousted George Bush." Mm-hmm. So I'd be like, "Yo, you don't understand the American system in Europe." You know what I'm saying? The government are afraid of, is afraid of the people, yeah. But in the U.S. People are afraid of the, the government. government, but he would stare at me like he wanted to kick my ass <laughs> because of his hatred for Bush. But mm-hmm. getting back to my initial question, now that Barack is in office, yeah, and these sentiments, like there's this hatred, there's this backlash, not just towards Obama, but to black people in general. Right, right. Is that fixing the glitch in a See, sense? To, to put to, niggas back in their to, place? It's a catch-22 because now the image of America worldwide is more diplomatic because the thing is America's going around the world saying we got to spread democracy. We're diverse. And people keep putting it back in their faces. Hey, we see how you're treating those black people over there. When you look at hostage situations, there's a movie Argo with um, Ben Affleck. Good Good movie. Good movie. Good movie. But they left something out over there in Iran when they took those hostages back in the like early 80s. They didn't let you know. They let the black people go. Yeah, the African American hostages, they let them go because they say we know what they do to you guys over here. We have no problem with a lot of situations, they let African American hostages go. Because they know. They, they already know. And Argo, the dude Ben Affleck was playing, he wasn't white. That's another thing they left out. Argo, the, the real guy, was um, Hispanic. Hispanic uh-huh. dude. Very important because the thing is, those other There's countries, a sensitivity. There's, there's a sensitivity to people of color. Exactly. And you notice whenever they try to ne- negotiate hostages in, in other countries that are American, who they send over? Whenever they try to get our hostages, they get they send Jesse Jackson. Mm. Remember that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. They yeah. send Jesse yeah. everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Because you know Jesse's not a political person, but they would send him over there to do because they knew they had more of affinity to Jesse Jackson. You, you know, it's 2014. Yeah, we're supposed to be so sophisticated. We yeah. got the iPhones, we got the internet, got all this information. But the 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 information that you show in Hidden Colors, yes, the series is virtually unknown. Yeah, it is. It's unknown. I send my kids to one of the top schools in the city and when i talk to their history teachers about i really want you to teach my kids about the history of africa they look at me with this blank face Mm. so the shit seems so overwhelmingly like 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 powerless like to change this system like like i'll I'll give you a story i'm kind of rambling but i'll give you the story i went to this brother's name uh charnier corey Mm. he has this uh store in brooklyn called leisure life okay so i'm sitting in this shop and there's this desert boot that looks so fly. He's got this desert boot in his shop. And I'm like, oh, that's Clark's. That's a Clark desert boot. He's like, no, it's the Veli. The Veli is the shoe that originated from Namibia. Um, and it's from this, this antelope-type cre- be- creature. The skin is from this antelope-type creature. I think they call it a Veli. And that's why they call the shoe a Veli. Hmm. It, it originated in Namibia. Now, when Clark's from England went to Namibia and saw the desert boot, he brought it back to Europe. And then hence... Clark's, you know, oh, desert boot. Yeah. And so when I go in stores now, when I go in stores, right, you see Italian products, you see French products, you see Chinese products, mm-hmm. you see Spanish, but there's no products that originated from Africa. Like, how much other shit did they steal from yeah. us? 
even man, we talked about that in Hidden Colors One. Man, we right. talked about the Italian clothes and Italian fashion, like alligator shoes. Ain't no damn alligators in Italy. Mm. <laughs> there are no alligators <laughs> in Italy. Right. Where, where, where they that. get the alligator? People never put that correlation together because the Moors were bringing all of these animals in from from. Africa. Right. So that's where they got all those fashion senses Hence from. Hence Maury. Maury Gators. Get, exactly. Get the fuck about. out yeah. of here. Maury, Maury's is playing the word Maurish. There was a dude, man, going back to the Moors. So Maury was not an Italian dude. No. No. Maury's is Maurish. That's what that stands for. I don't know any guy named Maury. He, <laughs> that was Italian. And the only Maury I knew was in Goodfellas and he got whacked because yeah, yeah. he wouldn't <laughs> shut the fuck up. Exactly. So but, what, what else are, are, but, are, on the shelves? Man. That are from our from our culture. Man, there's so much stuff. The whole fashion sense basically started in Europe. It was a black dude who was a more named um, Ziriab. It was a black man in the Middle Ages named Ziriab who literally started fashion sense in Europe. Right. He taught people how to cut their hair and style their hair a certain way. He taught people how to wear garments for the season. His name is Ziriab. That means black bird, but this guy was a singer. He was a celebrity in, in Europe and jet black dude. And history books don't ever talk about this, brother, man. So this is why it's important for us to tell our history because we got the resources. We got to stop depending on others to tell our story because, again, if you're trying to maintain your religion of white supremacy, why would you tell it? Right. So it's up to us to do that. You know, I'm glad you said that, man, that 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 white supremacist racism is a religion mm -hmm. because it makes a lot more sense. I, I read a lot of Tim Wise. Yeah. And he says that that white supremacist religion, I mean, white supremacy is a mental state. It's a mental illness. Mm. But what you're saying is more on point because it's harder to change somebody's religion exactly. than anything else. Exactly. Exactly. Because I can, you can sit up with a person and, again, a lot of white people know all the stuff that uh, that's in hidden colors. Do they, they know really it. know a it, lot, though? Because dude, they, it's the same uh, education system. Yeah. A lot of them, look, when I go to these museums and all of this stuff, again, they know what they have in their museums. They right. know what they have in their books. I'm but the average kid in America, average white kid in America does not A lot know. of, yeah, a lot of, but they're, they're following this religion blindly. Right. Exactly. They they because they want to believe black inferiority. They right. want to believe that. They want to believe that well blacks just don't work hard enough. They want to believe that blacks don't have family values. And if this they're is, excelling, they're only excelling in sports and entertainment. Exactly. And if a black person gets in a high position, well, that's because of affirmative action. Right. But we know that affirmative action it benefits more white women than anybody. So when you call that out, and again, I've had many debates with white supremacists. They run and they duck and dodge because they will not admit the truth. That's another thing. They won't just sit up and say, okay, look, you Africans did this and you did that because that's going to challenge their belief. So they'll run. And the and worst thing you can do is challenge somebody's religious belief. Cause Absolutely. People, that's what, that's, people kill each other for that. Absolutely. So, so what do we do, Tariq? Like, I didn't, I didn't see Hidden Colors 3. T tell us about Hidden Colors yeah, 3. Hidden Colors 3, we focused a lot on racism in America. Right. We really get down with racism, racism because in America. Because the prior to was like global. Right, right, right. We talk about racism in America. We talk about a lot of black inventions in America that were taken from us. There's what are some of the inventions? Stuff. Man. Other than the toilet bowl. Yeah. <laughs> we talk, uh, Paul Mooney talked about that. But, man, we created, there were black car companies that folks don't know about. Like what? There was, a, there was a Patterson car company out of um, Ohio. They had cars that were better than the Model T from Ford. From Ford. From Ford, yeah. But Ford and those guys, um, they, they priced those dudes I out. I always ask, why don't we have a, a, a black auto company? Yeah, we had that. Patterson. Patterson car company. And the reason why Ford was thorough, because of George Washington Carver. Ford was real good buddies with, with George Washington Carver, and he was creating all of these things. And they were using it, uh, using it at the Ford plant. Even soybean was created to make for cars and make for for military vehicles. That's for, what for, was, like in terms of like oils and all. Oh yeah, and you okay. make plastic out of soybean. You know okay. that? Yeah, so, I didn't know that. Yeah, so so, so for the, for the for the car body. For the, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, you make plastic and car parts. So they were getting all that stuff from George Washington. Car what body. else? Man, oh shit, we got a whole list of stuff in Hidden Colors Three. Um, and we talked about black people who owned railroad companies that were taken from them. We talked about black Wall Street, black people owned all of these prosperous businesses and the dominant white society. They were like, look, they get more powerful than us. We got to do something about this. So they were destroyed in many cases. So, you know, the, the narrative is that since slavery, we've been fucking up. Mm. You know what I'm saying? We've been fucking up. But, you know, I know that not to be true. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? You know, you've, we've had periods where black people have thrived. Absolutely. And then something happened to come along like bombs mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying, yeah. assassinations mm -hmm. or crack that's thrown us back. Exactly. So once again, here we are in 2014. Mm -hmm. it, it, is it too late? Are we too beaten? 
No, no, we're not, man. What we got to do is just start practicing group economics. We got to get an economic base because the thing is black people, if somebody keeps telling you, and let's go back to the street dudes and the pimps and the hoes and all that. One thing I noticed about the players on the street, one way certain dudes would break women down is by telling them that they weren't shit. You're a bitch. You're a bitch. And you're a hoe. You're a bitch, hoe, raggedy bitch, hoe, raggedy bitch, hoe. And then once you break her down, you can mold her into anything she wants to be or you want her to be. That's an old pimp technique. And that's been done to black folks for years. Centuries. Centuries. You ain't Endless. Shit. Endless. You Just turn on the TV. Every, and you can't escape it. That's the thing because black people try to walk away or run away from the racism. You can't do it. You can't do it. There was a lady named Jane Elliott. You're probably familiar with her. With the, with the blue eyed test. She's a white lady. Yes. She does these tests called the blue eye test. She's a teacher. And she get she does these training things with white people. And for an hour, they get white people in a room and they do this thing where they segregate the blue eyed whites from the brown eyed right. whites. And during the hour, she's going to discriminate against these people, talk down the to brown them. eyes or the, the blue the, eyes? The, either one. It, she switches it up. Okay. And she'll pick somebody out and discriminate against them. This goes on for just an hour. This woman does these training manuals. A lot of these white people can't last five minutes in this woman's class. The minute they start getting that discrimination, they're like, oh, enough of this. I don't, I have, to do, I don't this. have to take this. This is bullshit. This is bullshit. <laughs> and she said, you see that right there? These people can't take discrimination for five minutes, and you know it ain't real. And you expect these other people out here to take it every single day of their people lives. People are living a long time with it. Exactly. So how do you think they feel these black African Americans have to deal with that every single day? So that's a, that's a very profound thing to understand, but we can get over it. We have to understand their religion, and they're not going to change their religion anytime soon. Not at all. Let's just worry about us protecting ourselves from that. But how do we do that when we've already been conditioned, even the most successful of us? The, thing the is, most successful of us, but, like the Kanye's and whoever, even beyond mm, entertainment, yeah, believe that the white man's ice is colder. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And again, that's that whole mentality. You got to stop thinking like a whole, start thinking like a pimp your damn self, but not in a in a negative way right. as as far as hurting somebody, as far as taking control of your life. Right. We got to start controlling our own resources. We we become too dependent on the dominant society, and that weakened us. See, integration meant that black people only get to spend their money with white people. That's all integration meant. After the 60s, nothing really changed for black people. If you look it at it, it got worse. It got worse. Economically. After the, after, economically absolutely. in terms of like career and educational. So I got this theory and I, I don't want to subscribe to it, but I do believe that there's a major faction of integration that, that, that threw black people back and that segregation was almost in a sense better for us because we were more self-sufficient. Wait, it, and that's true to a certain degree. Now, segregation in the sense of being hung for stepping out of your boundaries. And institutional there. segregation right. is fucked up. Yeah, but as far as circulating our money, that's what we should have kept doing. We right. gave up our economic base. And the thing is, the reason why we did that is because that whole, well, the white man's ice is colder. We want to get approval. There's something in us that makes us want to get approval from those in the dominant society. I was at Sylvia Soul Food two days ago. Mm-hmm. Good food, by the way. Yeah. Yes. The service was shitty. Mm. And me and my, my family, we, we're there and we're looking at the shitty service. It took them forever to seat us. And we're like, God damn, it took them forever to bring our drinks and our food and all that stuff. And I'm like, OK, but. Every time a white person came in, black folks would run out from the kitchen. They ran to roll the red carpet out. They accommodated out. their white They houses. accommodated them like it was nothing. Right. And I'm like, it's not that they're incapable of giving good service. They just see themselves and us through the eyes of the dominant society, which is less than. So that's a very bad habit that we get into. So when we see white people are people in the dominant society. We get on our P's and Q's. We give them and we treat them in a superior manner because we look at ourselves differently. That's why I go into history to teach black folks, this is who you really are, not what they told you you were. I'll tell you, how much of an impact do you think that now, say, households are, you know, teaching not to be racist? Like, meaning like, you know, like where, where you, like, for instance, somebody like me who's growing up a, a daughter, you know, when I grew up, there was some, you know, racist. I had an uncle that felt a certain way or, yeah. you know, but I'm not like that to my daughter. Right. And uh, I'm not saying she's not going to see anything else in the world. Right. How much of an impact do you think? Because I do think that there's a lot of households now where it's taught, you know, to, you know. To be col- colorblind? Well, not to be colorblind, just to be more, be more open. Don't be like, you know, don't like. 
not to be racist. Like Are you, you know, you saying in white households, is, this is particularly, talk. I guess, yeah. in white white households, and and more and more so, just you know, how much of an impact you think that it would it would be that people aren't teaching that? Because I think that when you know, you see people who grew up, especially like I remember like in in, in, the, in the Benson Harris era, like you know, where people grow up and like. I don't mess with them, or they're not allowed around there. This and, and it teaches the next generation to grow up and 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 hate black people too. Right. Well, the thing is, unfortunately, look, all white people. We there's two type two types of white people: as non-white supremacists and white supremacists. And white supremacist doesn't mean a person with a skinhead swastika or a Klan mask on or whatever. Those are white extremists. But a white supremacist is anybody who thinks that they're superior to black people. And directly or indirectly, they act on that because racism is an action. It's not a thought. It's an action. Racism is systematic. It affects the lives of people of color. And there is no black racism when people say stuff like, well, racism goes both ways. I hate when they, when you when you when you call out something and they're like, you're being a racist. No, yeah. I don't control exactly. the resources. I tell when people ask, say, well, racism goes both ways. And I'm uh, sure you've been accused of being oh, a racist. Dude, I'm like, OK, tell me any law that ever existed that benefits me and disenfranchises any white person. Affirmative action. And I'm going to tell you the white people that it, it the white women that it helps. The gay white males, the white people who claim one fifth Native American, <laughs> all of these people. So let's not go there. There are no laws. There have never been a law in this country that has benefited blacks and disenfranchised whites at all. Mm. Racism is systematic, and that's a system that benefits those in the dominant white society and disenfranchises those who are considered black in America. But the thing is, when it comes to white supremacy, all white people don't have to be white supremacists for white supremacy to thrive. Because during Jim Crow, all white people were not anti-negro and all that but enough were right that that made it dangerous for black people even now even though all white people are not racist or white supremacists you got black women getting beat up by cops two brothers then got choked out up here in new york alone i mean this, we, we're seeing violent white supremacy come back in a in that jim crow style where is that form. coming from why is it that's coming back because it's it was always there it was always there remember this reg during the 60s most people didn't want to give up the privileges that they had in the dominant white society. Some of them said, oh, it's wrong doing that to black folks, but they didn't want to give that up. Nobody ever in America who's classified as white or no groups of white people ever said, you know what, let's stop all of this white supremacy. This is wrong. That never ever happened. Even during slavery, it didn't happen. The Civil War was not fought to end slavery. And we talked about that in Hidden Colors 1. Right. It was about states' rights. They were trying to expand slavery right. and in order to stop the South from getting too powerful, Lincoln said, okay, I'm going to free put, the slaves. They, they, they put Lincoln in a corner where he had to, he yeah, had to he, act on Yeah, he that. had to act on it. He said, okay, I'll free the slaves right. if y'all join us. And blacks who were working in the South or fighting for the South turned on the South. And this is why black people have been getting sabotaged by Southerners to this very day. They never got over that. That's mm -hmm. why all those lynchings and all that stuff happened. The Southerners never forgot that. So we have to understand the dominant white society, they've never said, okay, let's as a group stop practicing white supremacy and putting these people in this motherfuckers never loved us yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's just a, a cold reality right they like to pretend that in the 60s everybody said hey let's just get together and sing kumbaya right, right. that wasn't the case man if you look at the 60s black kids going to school with federal troops watching over them the federal government had to say hey look this is not a good look for us globally beating up church ladies and putting water hoses on them and sicking dogs Killing on them. four little girls in a whole night. Yeah, blowing up girls in church. That didn't look good around the world. The whole global community was looking at the U.S. So like, you're fucking up our money in a yeah, sense, basically. Yeah. You're fucking up our money with these images because that shit was going worldwide. Right. And you had brothers like Malcolm X about to go to the U.N., that's why that brother got yeah. off, by the way. When he started, he was cool when he was like, you know, going talking about when, the nation of Islam and all. Yeah. But the minute he started talking about, hey, you know what? I'm about to invite some white folks in my organization and I'm going to the U.N., that's when they got rid of Malcolm. And the same thing with King, by the way, too, because Dr. King. Because he was talking about economic empowerment. Dr. Dr. King, when he, he started talking. He wasn't about yeah. colorblind. And yeah. I hate the fact that they've bastardized Martin Luther King's teachings to be like, no, we're supposed to be color colorblind. Because I think colorblind is such an injustice. Yeah. You yeah. can't ignore somebody's color. color. You can't, exactly. 
Exactly. And again, that's the religion of white supremacy. Instead of us saying we accept a black person, we'll just make you colorless. Right. We'll accept that more than you. It's just like the magic Negro theory. When you look at movies, they <laughs> like to have the magic Negro, meaning a black person who's not really black. Yeah. He doesn't have a black background like Bagger Vance. He's just this invisible nigga who just popped up. With no nuts. No nuts, nothing. The Green Mile. Just this magic Negro oh, who popped up. Yo, just, oh. He's submissive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they love the magic Negro because he's a black guy who's not really black. He's not bringing he's that, for the white cause. Right. He's not bringing the black culture with him. Right. That so, whole thing. So once again, man, th- I agree with you wholeheartedly. Yes. The battlefield right now is economic empowerment. Yes, it is. And it might not be you who has the answers. Mm-hmm. I mean, I always, I mean, recently I've been thinking about, you know, we got to pull some economists in this. Yeah. You know, because people are too busy waiting for the next black leader. I'm not waiting for We don't need that no more. We don't need that anymore. All all we'll do is just get, they'll just pay some black folks to turn on him and and get him shot too. Right. We need leadership that cannot be assassinated, leadership that cannot be marginalized in the media. We need a code of conduct. And they're already economists. you got brothers like Dr. Claude Anderson, who has great books, Black Labor, White Wealth, Poweronomics, great books on what black people need to do economically to protect ourselves. And a lot of our issues, especially with these police beatings and the gentrification and all this stuff, it goes back to economics. It all goes back to economics. It always goes back to economics because, look, if we had an economic base, we could get politicians and police commissioners out of office. Exactly. You, you dig? We we don't have to sit up and just demand and march. Because that the picketing some, and the uh, and the petitions and and all of that's bullshit right now. Exactly. Right. There, there's a reason why you don't see them choking out no Asian dudes. The Asian cats, even though they're a small group in America, they own all types of banks. Their financial, they, 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 their economic fist is strong. They, they don't fuck around with their money. I heard a story years ago that never left me. I was talking to an older Jewish cat. Yeah. And he was sharing with me the 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 American, the New York Jewish plight in the fifties. And in the 50s, Jews were being discriminated left and right. Mm-hmm. Particularly, this particular instance was, 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 ah, was with regard to cab drivers. Yeah. Cabs did not stop for Jews mm-hmm. at all. So eventually, what they did, from what I understand, is they started to convene and say, listen, every time a cab doesn't stop, we complain to the TLC. Um, and that's a, that's, that's a fine. And the Jews started complaining about it so much in unison that it cost the the, 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 the TLC so much money that mm. they couldn't afford to pass another Jewish brother. You mm. know what I'm saying? Mm. And I'm saying, what does it take for us to have that that group think? Because we don't have that group think mentality unless it's mobbing, unless it's World Star, unless it's Jordan. Exactly. And we used to have it. Up until the 60s, we have it. When you look at the march on Selma, we had it. We had it. The Montgomery bus boycott. Right. See, people make it seem like the singing and the marching got them on their P's and Q's. No, no, no. It was the economic stranglehold they put out there on the people in Montgomery because black folks started carpooling. Black folks said, we ain't riding that bus. So that disrupted the whole economic order of Montgomery. They had to shut, lay off bus drivers. Then they had to shut down factories because people weren't getting to work. That messed up the tax bracket out there. So they messed up the economy. It's all about the dollar. It's all about the dollar, man. It's all about the dollar. So why the fuck are we still going to Miami? Why have we not boycotted Florida? Because the thing is, they tell black people instead of worry don't worry about group economics it's all about you they teach black people individualism that's what chuck d said it went from we to me yeah yeah they they do that with black folks at a young age in high school you're the star player you're gonna be the next you're different you're different dude you're gonna be the next rapper you're gonna be the next jay it's all about you it teaches us narcissism that they're going to tokenize us. We're going to get one special black person. We're going to give you all types of goodies. So we stand in line waiting on those goodies. And that's the problem. So Tariq, man, this this this, this can be solved? This can be fixed? It can be fixed. Man, we can fix this thing in a couple of years. All we got to do is circulate our money with each other. That's it. We got to practice group economics. Support circul- black businesses. S- support black businesses. Not be on that nigga shit when it comes to black businesses. Because the thing is, a lot of times we don't start black businesses because black customers start acting funny style. Right. Because they start saying, okay, this is a black business. I'm going to need that hookup. Let me get a, um, Let me get them <laughs> shoes for free, bro. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you ain't down. We got to cut that mentality out. That's too. another reason why I stopped practicing law. Because after a while, it was like, I'm working with you. I'm giving you these breaks. And right when you blow and about to go platinum, going across the street to the white lawyer. Yeah, exactly. I couldn't take that no more. That yeah. shit used to break my heart. Exactly. We got to cut that mentality out. 
we got to cut that mentality out and, and just keep practicing money, uh, group economics with each other and build our weight up. And, and the thing is, and I think Dame talked about that to a certain degree, how, you know, they kind of split them up with Jay and the whole shebang. And that happens all the time right. when they see a group of black folks really getting it in. They'll come in and infiltrate that. Yeah, so we got to huddle up against that. We got to huddle up against that. Just like with the Hidden Color series, I get all types of distribution options and offers, but I'm keeping this thing as 100% yes. independent, and yes. I like it that way. How good is this thing doing for you, it's man? It's great, man. It's the, the number one documentary in the country. I'm not talking about black documentary, documentary, period. I don't want to get in your pocket, yeah. but how are you using your economic power? Dude, I... Other, other than, other than I, one of the quotes that you read was yeah. you've done more for black America with this hit, these Hidden Color mm-hmm. series and most people have done since Spike Lee's Malcolm X. Absolutely. The Hidden Color series, man, they teach this stuff in schools, mm. universities, all over. The black bookstores are thanking me for bringing business back to them now mm. because people are getting the movies at their, their establishments and they're reading books from the authors and they're trying to get deeper. So that resurgence is happening right now. People are talking about these issues in schools and it's just really bringing that dialogue back. And, and, and with, with the economic power that you have right now, yes, give us an example of what you're doing. Oh, man, I'm... I'm I, I donate a lot of money to everybody. I'm always helping out new brothers and sisters coming up with new projects. And also Combat Jack show. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say that. Yes, indeed. But yeah, I, I, I got a clothing. I'm doing my clothing business and I, I just got all types of businesses going on. I have all types of people employed who work for me. So I feed a lot of people directly from my, my endeavors. Nice. And, and, I, and I, I encourage that with them too. You don't have your own shoes. Uh, I do. You, yeah, I do. you do. Yeah, right? Yeah. Because, Yes, I do. I'm I've seen that uh, on your website. Yes, indeed. I got those, too. What, what are the shoes called, man? The Flex Step Boots. I got the Flex Step Boots. Okay. I'm going to send you guys some. All right. Thank yes, you, indeed. man. Yes, indeed. Well, what else are you working on? I could sit here and talk to you for hours, man. Yes, but... indeed. I got some. I, I'm actually, man, um, the network's always calling me. I'm working on a relationship show. Okay. Yeah. Uh, they've been trying to give me a relationship show for a long time. You know, with, with TV now, they got a, a deal. Now, you know how in the music industry, they got the 360 deals yes. where they get a piece of everything you do. Right. They're doing that with reality shows now. Yeah, you know, it's funny, man. Even though I don't practice law for the past year, last year I did a lot of reality TV deals. Okay. And it's amazing how they're like, yo, even though you got a business, once you come on our show, anything you create is ours. Nigga. Dude. <laughs> they give me those kind con- Dude, that's why I haven't signed for a long right. time. Because I had to get all types of clauses in these contracts saying, okay, look, I already got this established. You can't get this. So that that's the reason why it's taken me so long to get the, something popping on TV like that. Because I can't give up all my stuff because I already got books and stuff established. They're trying to get everything you do. Right. For the rest of your life. I'm saying if, what they call it in Hollywood is the Bethany Frankel clause. Because mm, this chick. Yeah, from the, the housewives. House, yeah, yeah, yeah. They call it the Bethany She's got Frank- the skinny girl drinking the whole. Yeah, she made multi Crazy. She made crazy money. And they're like, look, we ain't going to let that happen again. Oh, without, she's the, she, they yeah. fixing the glitch. They fixed that glitch. Right. They're like, we made some nobody housewife that nobody knew. A media mogul. Yep. We ain't gonna let that happen again uh, without us getting a piece. That's good to know. Yeah, man. yeah. So, 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 and then you, you tell us about your radio, your, your podcast. Yeah, yeah. The, the Tariq Lee Radio Show. I do that every Wednesday. That's at TariqRadio.com. Um, you guys can get the film Hidden Colors three and one two all of them at HiddenColorsFilm.com, and um, all, Twitter at um Tariq Nasheed. Okay, listen, brother. This has been so. I mean. This is this has been great, man. Class and, 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 and bootleggers, all you bootleggers. Oh yeah, I heard you was in Harlem <laughs> yesterday, Be- flipping beating up tables. the Asians, no. beating up the, the Jamaicans, Africans, the Africans. <laughs> you was beating up the Moors, no bootleggers, <laughs> shit. <laughs> No, I had to G-check a couple of dudes. You know, it was cool. I was real respectful. Well, you were walking down the street? I was walking down the street, and I saw some Hidden Colors DVDs. Which one? Was, one, two, and three? I saw two and three. Oh, they had the, they had the box set? Oh, she man. Had a, <laughs> had a, the trilogy? Yeah, they had two and three, so I just confiscated a few nice, of them. Nice, man. Yeah, but nice. I, was, I was respectful to cats. But Now, it's good to see you doing really well, man. You're not gaming us, are you? No. Are you, ga- are you gaming the black community right no, now? how? <laughs> I'm just saying, man, because you're such a hustler. No, man. Hustling is good. <laughs> right. You know, there's a good hustle in the back. There's a difference between a hustle and a scam artist. Yes. See, the people mistake the two. A uh, hustler is somebody, man, you do something constructive, and the rewards outweigh the risk, and the collateral damage is not as, as maximum. A scam artist is a smash and grab nigga. Somebody who's thinking of stuff on the fly, a quick buck, quick dollar, um, trying to make a buck. The risk always outweigh the rewards. This yes. is why you got dudes out here robbing liquor stores, getting $100, and then end up getting 20 years in jail. <laughs> that's, 
That's scam artist That's hustling shit. backwards, right? That's hustling backwards. Yeah, That's yeah. scam artist shit right there. Well, Tariq, yeah. man, once again, man, it's, it's been an honor talking to you, man. I man, think this my is pleasure. Great. I think our listeners will enjoy this. Pete, what do you think, man? With I all think this, it was great, man. Morris. I, did, <laughs> I tell you one thing. It was like class. Morris knowledge right It was class right for me. Now. And, 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 and uh, you know, I know you speak a lot about, you know, um, race and, and, and how important. It's important, man. And, yeah, no, no, definitely. So, so you know, you this is going to be a great episode because you were so into it and, uh, you know, you definitely knowledgeable to eat, man. And, man, uh, much respect. You no, know, I, I, I learned a lot just, just listening, man. And I know the listeners will too. Last thing, Tariq, I yeah. got this theory because mm-hmm. I don't think anything is random. Mm. And I, and while we're trying to figure this out, black and white, it just hit me recently, man. Like we all have a greater purpose. I think mm-hmm. us being on this planet together, is kind of like this test. Yeah. And the test is we all have different attributes. Mm-hmm. And once we combine our different attributes together, we'll have the mysteries of life solved. Absolutely. But right now we're fucking up the test. Mm-hmm. What, what, what do you think of that? That's absolutely true, man. And, and again, the problem is, and we can't be afraid to call it what it is, man. Systematic white supremacy is a cancer. It's a cancer. It's a cancer, man. Yes. It's a cancer, and it's affecting all of us negatively. White. Mm-hmm. And how does it? How does it affect white people negatively? It affects white people negatively because number one, it creates. Um, a negative image of you and people want to target you around the world. This is why America's money and resources goes into defense for the most part. You can't keep spending money on defense. The money's going to run out eventually. Yeah. What are you going to do then? Yeah. This is why they keep showing all these purge movies and all of these apocalypto type of movies because now you just can't go all your life fighting and defending yourself. How about trying to live in harmony and just create a system of justice to replace the system of white supremacy. Yeah, and I, that's and, all we want. And I inherently believe, man, what's fucked up is there's some brother in South Central, mm-hmm. there's some brother in Detroit, there's some brother in Harlem that might have the cure for cancer, mm-hmm. that might have the cure for AIDS, that might have the the, the solution for like endless energy production, mm-hmm. but because that brother does not have access. We're all fucking up. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and that's not justice. We got to replace the system of white supremacy with a system of justice. It's that simple. Well, thank you, sir. You no know, doubt. And you know, you, whenever you come to New York, man, just, even if we have a guest on, man, just come through. No doubt. Just come through, no man, doubt. and be get, be a guest host yes, on our show. Yes, indeed. Pete. Yo, d- d- this dude's one smooth motherfucker. I'll tell you that one. <laughs> Yo, you went. I, I like. I had questions I wanted to ask you about pussy, and like, and all of a sudden, like, you got me like all knowledgeable about race. I'm like, where the fuck did he go? Like, Yo. I was still waiting to ask you about like the trim, you know. But like, you know, like I said, we, definitely. We can touch come. on that next time. No, yeah, no, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Listen, yeah. it was great, man, and 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 and. Like I said, the internet isn't gonna love it, man. Internet, you know what this is, man. Dream those dreams and then man up and live those dreams because of life. Without dreams, it's black or white, and the universe flows in technicolor and surround sound. Bow. Bitches. Cheer. Numenati! This episode of the Combat Jack Show was produced by Jonathan Mena, executive produced by A. King and Chris Morrow, and recorded in the Engine Room Audio Studio in downtown Manhattan. This is an official Loudspeakers Network's production.